Um, seeing all of our members present, and we do have a quorum. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Rallo? Here. Bolin? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Scandalari? Here. Sims? Here. Flaherty? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Smith? Here. And Sandberg? Here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, this is today's regular session. The date is Wednesday, Feb February 17, 2021. Um, today's agenda summation is we will have the approval of some minutes. Then we will have reports, um, either A, council members, mayor, city officers, council committees, or and we'll have a spot for public comment. Um, I will remind everyone for public comment that that time will be limited to 20 minutes. Then we'll move on to appointments to boards and commissions. Then we have legislation for second readings and resolutions. Ordinance 21-02 to rezone a 10.097 acre property from planned unit development, PUD, to mixed use corridor, MC regarding the Bill C. Brown Revocable Trust, who's a petitioner. Then we have Ordinance 21-03, which was formerly Ordinance 20-33, to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel, regarding Chapter 2.02, .02, Boards and Commissions Revised, and Chapter 2.04, Common Council Revised. Then we have uh, one item for first reading, that is Ordinance 21-06 to amend Title II Administration and Personnel of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding adding Chapter 2.87, Protections for People Experiencing Homelessness. Then we'll move on to additional public comments. Um, this section for public comment will uh, be a maximum of 25 minutes. Then we'll have matters regarding council schedule, and then we'll have adjournment. Do we have minutes for approval? Mr. President, I move that the minutes from July 19th, 2006, September 6th, 2006, September 13th, 2006, September 20th, 2006, September 27th, 2006, and December 6th, 2006, be approved. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and seconded for approval. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Rallo? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That motion passed 9 0. We'll move now to reports um, from council members. We'll start and I'll call as I see from my left and moving to the right. So, first, Council Member Scambellari. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to take a minute and express my thanks to Ms. Erin Hatch. For those of you who have not met her, Erin is a certified arborist. She is our urban forester here for the city of Bloomington. Um, I just wanted to express my thanks. She's been working with several of my constituents lately regarding uh, the tree canopy in Lower Cascades, and she has been incredibly responsive. And I just wanted to express my thanks for that. So uh, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Council Member Scambler. Um, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. And my uh, quick thanks, as we always do when we have snow events, is to thank our public's public works department. This was a particularly difficult one. It kept going and going and going. Uh, and it's hard to clear when the snow is still coming down. But our crews do a really great job, and we thank them for it. And uh, uh, kudos to Adam Wason for managing this fine department. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Council Member Smith. Well, I'm, I'm going to add my thanks to uh, 
Joe Vandeventer and Adam Wason for helping out with a couple constituent issues with snow uh, in Elm Heights and in uh, Park Ridge. So uh, shout out to those guys. They did a great job of responding and helping them out. So thank you, uh, uh, Adam and Joe. That's all for me. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. I have no report tonight, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Volan. Yes, I wanna pile on with the thank yous. Uh, I experienced a theft several days ago and I just want to thank the um, uh, Officer Fosna and the others uh, on third shift of the Wounded Police Department who are uh, acting with all due haste to catch the culprit. Um, their uh, his professionalism, uh, I'm very pleased with and uh, uh, the the police department has gotten on it promptly. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Olin. Council Member Rosenbarger. No report, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rallo. Uh, yes, I'd like to express my gratitude to city employees as well for working under uh, such harsh and clement conditions and uh, street department, public works, but also utilities. Uh, there was a substantial water main break a few days ago uh, over College Mall and uh, in terrible conditions. So um, they work regardless around the clock. And so I uh, want to express my, my thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Allo. Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yes, just wanted to mention that I'll be having uh, my monthly constituent meeting on Monday uh, next week at 5.30 p.m. Uh, that'll be via Zoom, and you'll you can access the um, the link and the invite uh, via my council Facebook page, uh, Facebook.com/slash Flaherty for Bloomington. So thanks. Thank you, Councilman Member Flaherty. Um, with all the snow that we've had, um, no pun intended, but I'd like to pile on <laughs> with the accolades as well um, for our city staff. Um, uh, many of the things have already been mentioned, but I was particularly impressed with. Those that have, um, or uh, not so much impressed, but thankful for, but those that have signed up for notices from the city uh, receive uh, either emails or text or um, voice messages, I believe, letting everyone know that city services, in particular city hall and park and rec offices and, and facilities were not going to be open during the snow event. Um, as well as I think there was a very fine job done informing our community that um, there would be no trash pickup as well. Um, and when I asked um, Deputy Mayor Renheisen, and this is something I didn't know, but if we had a snow event that interrupted trash service for two days in a row, then it is ended for that week and picked up at the beginning of next week. Um, so I'm saying that so in case any of our community members did not know that and we're in such an event again, um, then everyone has been informed. And again, I just want to say thanks to everyone that helped keep our streets passable and in a lot of cases, um, and not every case, but our sidewalk safe as well. So thank you all very much. Uh, do we have anyone from the mayor or city offices uh, to report this evening? Seeing none, um, we'll move down to council committee reports. Um, uh, council Member Smith, are we prepared for the we, sidewalk we committee are. report? We are. Thank you, uh, President Sims. Uh, I'm here to give the sidewalk report um, for February 17, 2021. Um, the committee members are Jim Sims, uh, myself, Kate Rosenberger and Dave Rollo. Um, I also wanted to make sure I gave a shout out to Beth Rosenberger, Mallory Rickbile, Neil Copper and Roy Atten who helped us greatly uh, and did an awful lot of work in our uh, working on the sidewalk allegation. Um, the sidewalk, uh, began and the committee began kind of in 1992 with surplus revenues from the neighborhood parking program, was dedicated to reducing community's dependence on the automobile. It started out with about $6,000 and uh, now it's at $330,000. Uh, 
So it's it's certainly gone up, um, but this is my first go around with the sidewalk committee, and I think we need more money. So uh, I'll just say that out loud. Um, what what went on was we had a series of meetings and uh, looked at it. The money's come from the uh, alternative transportation fund from some CDBG funding, some city of Bloomington utilities and some hand monies. We looked at approximately 50 some uh, projects that were on a list and through uh, consultation with the city staff and other committee members, um, what we did is we looked at uh, the criteria for selecting sidewalks and it was based on uh, safety considerations, roadway classifications, pedestrian usage, proximity to destinations, linkages, cost and feasibility. Those are the uh, criteria that have been used. Um, we had an extended discussion during some of the meeting uh, of improving the criteria to include uh, income equity, racial equity, and uh, any other factors that would would make it, uh, you know, a more equitable look see at the uh, allocating new sidewalk construction. I thought that was a great discussion, and I believe that transportation planning and transportation is going to look at that further, and uh, we'll make sure that we keep improving those so that we have a fair distribution to all our citizens in Bloomington. The uh, city staff and the committee uh, discussed and ended up prioritizing uh, about five different items on the list. Um, there was new sidewalk design and there was continued uh, completion of the construction. There was also a small amount of money left over that was allocated for uh, traffic calming, which will be through the new, uh, allocated through the new traffic allocation, uh, sorry, uh, traffic calming allocation process. Um, and so that's, that was a real nice thing to come out of it as well. The report, and the information about uh, the different uh, projects, they are on the city's website. And I'm looking to see if it's important for me to tell you Well, I, I think we ended up with uh, an allocation of two new projects. We finished uh, the construction of some other projects. And I think that's about all I need to say. Any, anything else that uh, is important for us to say about the sidewalk committee uh, process, Mr. Lucas? Now I'm, I'm happy to display any any portions of the report if council members are interested in, in seeing the specific uh, projects recommended or the uh, formal recommendation sheet that lists the uh, ranked priorities of the projects. Um, I see one one head nod from council member Piedmont Smith. I'm not sure what what she'd like me to display. What would you, what would you like to see? May I, Mr. President? Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, if you could display what the uh, funded projects were and how much they each got. I don't know. Hopefully that's all on one page. I think that would be helpful for the public as well. Okay. The uh, project, uh, the design in the uh, right of acquisition uh, is Dunn Street from 15th Street to 16th Street on the west side. The uh, estimated right of way allocation or uh, 
money that was will be needed for that estimated is thirteen thousand dollars, and the design is twenty eight. So that Fifteenth uh, Street to Sixteenth Street West Side is about forty one thousand. Construction of sidewalk South Walnut from East Winslow Road to Ridge View Drive on the east side right away was uh, nothing. And the construction of that, it's a larger project, is $210,000. The remainder of the design and right away acquisition for the next project is Adam Street from Kirkwood to Fountain Drive on the west side. Remainder of the design is 26,000. Right away cost is 44, a total of 66,000. And lastly is the uh, general traffic common and greenways program, uh, which was remainder of 13,000. And uh, the slide is a graphic representation of the uh, uh, most recent process designed by planning and transportation. Yeah, and so that ends up being a total down at the bottom of $330,000. And I'll, I'll note too, if, if I may, that uh, committee chair Smith just went through the projects in the order that the committee prioritized them. Uh, the last, uh, or the, the page I've got displayed here shows each of the projects and their uh, prioritized rankings and has a note that the committee's overage policy allows for shifting of some funds uh, based on uh, how the bids come in for each of the, the various stages of construction uh, to give planning staff a bit, a bit of leeway uh, to move funds around from one project to the other. Um, and the, the ranked priorities uh, also communicate which projects should be fully funded uh, first uh, to staff. Thanks for pointing out the priority, Mr. Lucas. And uh, any other questions from council members? And uh, then this then is becomes approved and then it will be added to the website, correct, Mr. Lucas? Correct, the council uh, tonight could consider a motion to approve that report uh, planning staff typically waits for the council to do so before moving ahead with any of the uh, recommended projects. So once the report, uh, assuming the report is approved by the council tonight, uh, we will pass that along to planning staff, uh, make that available to the public um, on the uh, sidewalk committee's website. Thank you. Do we have any further questions or comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, um, I'd like to make a comment. I, th I think this was a particularly trying year with the Council Sidewalk com uh, Committee, um, and there was much discussion, as Chair Smith um, uh, stated earlier. Um, many of it had to do with um, how the sidewalk projects and some of our calming, um, traffic calming projects had been decided over the years. Um, there were some questions of equity um, and with regard to the criteria used to select which projects um, that the committee decided to plan for and, and, and fund. Um, of course, in conjunction with the engineer and planning and transportation um, staff. Um, I would also like to note that, um, give my appreciation to Mr. Mark Stossberg who um, provided us some data, some research data that had to do with um, economic and racial equity issues um, as he researched and compiled. Um, it was very robust discussion. Um, I wouldn't say that we were all in total agreement, but I, I am very thankful for Mr. Stossberg to bring that to our attention and I believe much of the items that he researched and are part of the data will be used by the planning department um, in considering uh, the best way to update the criteria um, for selecting projects in the future. So 
Um, thank you, Chairman Smith, for that report. Um, just wanted to add my two cents. Um, Mr. Lucas or Mr. Flaherty, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments? Okay, Mr. Lucas or Mr. Flaherty, is this um, up for public comment? I, I believe that's up to the chair. Um, I, I think uh, in the past, uh, council may have entertained public comment on the report. I, I will note that the committee uh, also entertained public comment at two of its yes. meetings before uh, making these recommendations, but uh, I, I believe it would be up to the chair as to whether to entertain a public comment or up to the council, excuse me. Okay, well, being the chair of the council, um, I would entertain a motion for approval. I move to approve the report for the 2017, sorry, 2021 sidewalk report. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll, please? Yes, um, Councilmember Bowling. Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. P. Mount Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. Thank you. And I'm, thank you. And that motion passed nine zero. Um, while we're still under council committees, um, I do have a quick report uh, that I think is a matter of housekeeping, but something that needs to be announced in the council meeting. And that had to do with the makeup of our 2021 um, council standing committee assignments. Um, the change that was made is that council member Bolin is no longer on the Community Affairs Standing Committee, and he has been replaced by myself, Councilmember Sims, on the Community Affairs um, Standing Committee. Um, all other announcements made at previous council meetings are intact and um, in place for operation for 2021. So thank you very, very much. Um, now we'll move to public comment. And I'll add that members of the public may speak on matters of community concern not listed on today's agenda at one of the two public comment opportunities. Citizens may speak at one of these periods, but not both. Speakers are allowed five minutes. This time allotment may be reduced by the presiding officer if numerous people wish to speak. I will remind the public that in order to um, uh, be recognized for public um, comment, you can please raise your hand, uh, use the raised hand function on Zoom or send our meeting host uh, a message on chat to be recognized. Um, I would also like to remind the public that if during public comment, if there is more than one person on the same uh, communication device, uh, on the same computer or the phone, please let us know when the time comes. Um, uh, so we can pretty have a decent count on who would like to speak this evening. Um, we're going to start with five minutes. Um, Mr. Lucas, can we take a count of those wishing to speak? Let's see if we need to alter the time allotted. I think I see three hands and one in chat. I, I see the three hands raised. I'm not sure if oh, someone no. sent a chat message directly. No, I'm sorry. No, that was something else. Sorry. I, I see three hands raised at the moment. Okay. Um, if that's the case, then each would have five minutes. First up, I believe Tina Honeycutt, who should now be able to unmute. <clears throat> Good evening. As Good promised. evening, Tina. You, you have five minutes, Tina. Good evening. Thank you, Jim or Mr. Thames, Tina Honeycutt, <laughs> as, as promised, I'm here to again speak to you all about 
um, those in our community that are unhoused. Uh, I would like to point out that the wording on the emergency warming station seems particularly uh, aggressive towards people that might need to go to the fire stations because they, they need warmth or don't have heat or home. Um, I don't know if you all have noticed it, but we didn't even get warming stations opened until after it had been uh, in the single digits for a couple of days. And it says food showers and areas for sleep are not available. In, cop in capital letters, it tells you to come in, be quick, and move on. I don't know if you've been outside, but it's pretty And so um, it's just, I'm, I'm consistently disheartened by the tone that the city is taking. And I just don't understand. I, I'm living in... Bloomington, Indiana, we've been telling ourselves, patting ourselves on the back about what great work we do and how we're progressives and liberals and we take care of our own. And then we continue to harm our neighbors in this way as a city. And we take these aggressive stances. We have people that are living outside right now and we have these programs, but there isn't enough for the people here. And we continue to talk about it and talk about it. I wanna see more action. And I, I realize that there's going to be some look at um, provisions that you might talk more kindly about our unhoused neighbors but I want more than talking. I want to see more action. I see my time. Thank you for your comments. Who's next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is RM. You should now be able to unmute. Good evening, council. Uh, hi, hi, Renee, how are you? You have five minutes. I'm doing okay, Jim, how are you? Okay. I'm fine. Can you identify yourself, please? Renee Miller. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ithaca, New York, Madison, Wisconsin, Eugene, Oregon, Olympia, Washington, Austin, Texas. That's just to name a few of the many cities, many, many cities that have um, come up with some positive solutions to the homeless crisis in their cities. The policies coming out of the mayor's office and this council failed to serve all of our community members. I am proud we have some council members who do and are embarrassed by those who don't come up with some solutions. You serve no one when you do not serve all. We cannot hear from our homeless if we don't have public meetings. We understand why we're not having public meetings. We also understand, at least those of us that know the people like we do, um, that these people don't have electricity, so they don't have places to charge their phones. So that's yet another layer of hardship. So they can't come to these meetings. They have no way to come to these meetings. So I think it's time to find a way to have socially distanced meetings in public so everyone can attend the meetings. Um, now I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna switch quickly so I can get all, all these things in. Um, if I can do it quickly. Um, when, we, when we have a mayor and a council that has a desire to find lasting creations or lasting solutions, then we serve all of the community. So the names of those cities that I listed off have found those solutions in small community settings that they have built for our homeless population to use as a building block to get their lives back on track. Um, the thing with sending people to shelters, it's just like being on a hamster wheel. 
It doesn't ever really do anything for those people. It's just sending them to a shelter. We have to have places that people can lock, have a lockable door to protect their belongings so they can go to work, they can go to a store, they can go to doctor's appointments. You do lock your doors, don't you, when you leave your house? It is time to stop causing the hamster to turn, the hamster wheel to turn. It's time for solutions. The hamster wheel is saying go to the shelter. A shelter isn't a home. A home has a door and is the solution, a lockable door. Small home villages are affordable and can be built quickly. Hotels also have lockable doors. The city and the council <clears throat> could okay buying a older hotel and making that a place for our homeless population. We do similar housing with Habitat for Humanity with small homes, and we can do it for our homeless too. And the city must lead the way like so many other cities across the U.S. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for, Council? It is our responsibility to serve all. It's your responsibility to serve all, not just someone with a five or six digit income. Your policies and lack of movement towards solutions is short-sighted, classist, racist, homophobic, anti-Semitic, and ableist, and is not serving all, but only those aforementioned. So I ask you today to change. Change by either committing to writing proposals to help or to vote for said proposals that are brought forth. Otherwise, stand up, give up your seat, because there's lots of people that will make those their priorities. Our neighbors need housing that pro provide lockable doors, and that is imperative for people living on the street to get them off of the street. It is how we treat people with dignity, respect, love, and compassion until solutions are brought forth Stop your sweeps, stop your sweeps at the Houseless Neighbors Park, also known as Seminary Park, Seminary Square Park. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Who's next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Alex Goodlad. Hmm. Hey, Alex, Good. you have five minutes. Got it. Good evening. Um, so, I want to kind of talk about the state of public safety meeting, which I believe that was, forgive me, like for just, I mean, time flies when um, things are crazy, but I think that was uh, Friday. That was, I think either two Fridays ago. Yeah, that was, that was like not last Friday, but the Friday before, but um, there was a, I think like a meeting that was, it didn't have public comment. I don't remember what meeting it was called. But anyway, I'm digressing. I want to talk about kind of that because it's reminiscent, I think, to the uh, just kind of the homeless issue, I guess. So there was so there were three departments, I believe, that talked during the state of public safety. There was the um, the city department. There was the um, the police department, and then the firefighter department. And I want to go in reverse order of which I said those um, different departments, so, like what I like the most and what I like the least, and then reasons why. So let's start with the fire department. I really actually, I like the fire department because they were really transparent as to, you know, what they were actually changing and what they were looking to do to like, to try and mitigate COVID. Like it seems like they were really taking that seriously and they seemed pretty introspective overall. Now, BPD, let's let's talk about that next. Now, I, one thing that I think bothers me in general about just police departments across the country, maybe the biggest thing, and, and it might seem minor, but I think it actually leads to the issues that we're having is that there's just n like like nothing I've, I've never read a police statement that has ever like taken ownership of anything they did for example you have the lapd i i'm not sure if you've heard about the valentine's day george floyd meme it was it was a pretty bad meme 
Uh, I don't want to make too big of a deal of it, but it was it was bad. And they were they kind of like obfuscate themselves and say, oh, we didn't create the meme. That that's just one example. And I, I've never seen a police statement that ever owned up ever, like in any police department ever. So 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 the the, the Bloomington Police Department um, meeting though, I'd I'd give like a maybe a six out of ten, and then the fire department like an eight out of ten for what they did, because because at least what the police department did was kind of like they're moving, I think overall in the right direction. I mean we can we can critique that you know social work I think should be its own department, but at least they're moving towards that model of. Um, of averting duties that really shouldn't be taking care of the police to social work. So I think we're going in the right direction there, but I really think that DPD to really um, make change, they, they need to, they need to really look into their use of force rate, which is pretty discriminatory when you look at it. And I want to end at the city, assuming that I have like enough time for that, which, and my, my, Problem with the city, I, I give what the that speech a, 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 like a two out of ten, and the reason for that is that they're just they're, they're extremely how, how do I put it like they just like they act like that they're like they just kind of deny that they're part of the problem at all with like the homeless issue and it's like oh we like we think it's a great idea to um, like now suddenly like do something when there's 17 fucking cases at Wheeler Mission. So like th th they mentioned that and they acted like, oh, th there's kind of no problem at all when there's a huge problem. And it's it's kind of, it comes off as disingenuous. They And finally they're like, oh, we're gonna put public restrooms at the parking garage. Mr. Goodlad, you have about 40 seconds. Um, and if you don't mind, please uh, avoid offensive language. Go ahead. You have your full try, 40 seconds. I'm pretty offended by, it's hard not to be offensive when there's, you know, again, 17 cases at Wheeler Mission. And, and then that, that leaks into the other shelters and, and, and then no isolation shelters. So like, so and, and and then suddenly they decide that oh like bath public bathrooms are a good idea when we've recommended to have porta potties at the park forever they could have listened to that they could have like like what what the heck and um, yeah I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Do we have anyone else, Mr. Lucas? Don't believe so. No. Okay, we'll give it just. Uh, Another second or two. Okay, seeing none. Do we have any appointments to boards and commissions this evening? Council Member Scott. President. Um, uh, yes, sir. Oh, I, I had one, but I'll wait. Okay, thank, thank you. Councilmember Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Um, on behalf of the Community Affairs Committee, which is Council Members Rollo, Sandberg, Sims, and myself, I'd like to bring uh, recommended appointments as follows. For the Hispanic and Latino Affairs Commission, I, we'd like to recommend Nico Siegler, Amy Oakley, and Pedro Ramirez. For the Commission on the Status of Women, Point excuse of me. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Council Member Scambolari. Yes. As you're making these appointments, you'll need to remember to appoint them to specific seats. So if you could restate those appointments with the specific seat you're appointing them to, I'd appreciate it. I will. Thank you. So again, for the Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs, Nico Siegler reappointed to seat C3. Amy Oakley reappointed to seat C2. And Pedro Ramirez reappointed to seat C5. For the Commission on the Status of Women, Landry Culp appointed to seat C4. For the Commission on Aging, Kelsey Hareslip reappointed to seat C4. Also for the Commission on Aging, Jack Kahn reappointed to seat C3. For the Arts Commission, Quentin Stroud reappointed to seat C1. 
and Babette Ballinger reappointed to seat C2. Second. Thank you. Um, it's been properly moved and second. And I'm sorry, um, clerk, before we vote, can you please repeat those? I, I was going too fast, I couldn't write them all down, sorry. Mr. President, did you want the clerk to do that or would you like me to do that? Whichever is easiest so that, uh, let's, uh, let's have the clerk do okay. it. That makes, that makes, we'll make sure she's got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So I had for Hispanic and Latino Affairs, Nico Sigler for seat C3, Amy Oakley for seat C2, Pedro Ramirez for seat C5, for Commission on Aging, Kelsey Hayslip for seat C4, Jack Khan for seat C3, for the Arts Commission, Quentin Straw for seat C1, and Babette Ballinger for seat C2. Is that correct? Status of women. And for the Commission on Status of Women, Landry Culp for seat C4. Sorry, I missed her. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, it's been pro uh, Council Member Flaherty. Uh, yeah, just a point of order. I'm sorry if I misheard uh, at the beginning, but I think when we're making sharing these recommendations from committees uh, and and moving that the council appoint um, as recommended, I think we need to make sure we say that that's part of the motion. If just if uh, Councilmember Scambolari wants to, and and other members, if there's other recommendations tonight, clarify um, that they are making a motion to appoint members as opposed to. Uh, just listing the recommendations. Um, I just want to make sure we got that part right. Um, so clarify, uh, on behalf of the Community Affairs Committee, we would like to recommend those appointments. Uh, or, I guess um, I'm suggesting we you should to, move that they like be appointed. We would like to move those appointments. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Second again. Thank you, I'm sorry, I heard the, the second the first time and I thought it was a motion, so I apologize. Thank you, um, Council Member Flaherty. Um, it's been properly moved and second. Um, do we have any questions or comments from council members? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, council member Rosenberger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Bolin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was 9 0 on the appointment to the Hispanic and Latino Affairs the Commission on Women, the Commission on Aging, and the Arts Commission. Thank you all, 9-0. Uh, Council Member Rallo. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would like to, on the behalf of the Climate Action and Resilience Committee, move the following appointments to the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability. Christy Anderson to seat C1. Uh, Joseph Wania to seat C2, and Colin Murphy to seat C4. Second. Okay, thank you, sir. It's been moved and second. Uh, any questions from council? Okay, seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, just a second. Council Member Scambolari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Wollen? Yes. And Rosenberger? Yes. Thank you. That is approved 9-0. Um, do we have any further? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. 
Yes, on behalf of the Climate Action and Resilience Committee, um, I move that we appoint the following individuals to the Environmental Commission. Dedamia Whitney to seat C1. Scott Shackelford to seat C2. Daniel Gonzalez to seat C3. And a reappointment of Don Eggert to seat C5. Second. Thank you, been properly moved and second. Any questions from council members? Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. One moment, please. Okay, Council Member Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Member? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Okay. And Scambolari? Yes. Thank you. And that's nine zero for the four seats uh, appointed on the Environmental Commission. Thank you. Uh, do we have any further? appointments to boards or commissions. Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Housing Committee, I move to appoint to the Housing Quality Appeals Board, Susie Hamilton to seat C1, and Diana Apata to seat C3. And then uh, for the Redevelopment Commission, I move to reappoint Nick Kappas to seat C1 and to appoint Deborah Meyerson to seat C2. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. Councilmember Rosenbarger, would you mind um, restating which seat you were recommending Deborah Meyerson for? C2. C2? Yes, I'm pretty sure that's right. We have two vac. We only have two seats on there and two vacancies. Okay. Do you think it's a different seat? I think we did. I mean, we just have two. I, I can double check it if there's an error. I'm just, I just have to log in. But that is what I had down. Yep, we just have C, C1 and C2. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, any questions from council members seeing none will the clerk please call the roll council member flaherty yes piedmont smith yes smith yes sandberg yes Rollo? yes Wallen? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. And Sims? No. Thank you. And that passes eight to one. Um, the seats for the Board of Quality Housing Appeals um, and the uh, Redevelopment Commission, RDC. Thank you. Do we have any other um, appointments to boards or commissions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, we'll now move down to legislation for second readings and resolutions. And we do have some legislation ready 
for re second reading tonight. Councilmember Flaherty. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Mr. Okay. President, I move that Ordinance 2102 be introduced and read by synopsis by the clerk. Um, sorry, by title and synopsis only by the clerk. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Um, yes, Councilmember P. Brown Smith. Yes. Smith. Okay, Sandra? Yes. Yes, sorry. Rallo? Yes. Mullen? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Mallory? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, has been properly moved to second and approved 9 0. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2102 to rezone a 10.097 acre property from plan unit development to mixed use corridor, regarding Bill C. Brown revocable trust petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2102 resorts 10.097 acres from plan unit development to mixed use corridor. Your land use committee recommendation for amendment one was due pass 300 and your recommendation on the ordinance as amended was due pass 300. Thank you very much. Um, our council Mr. member Flaherty. I move that ordinance 2102 be adopted. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Um, do we have city representative here to be part of the pres presentation? I do see the petitioner. Uh, yes, I'm here. Council member Pete Ma Smith. Oh, I, I was wondering if you wanted the land use committee report, but we can do that after. No, 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 no. Actually, I um, that's I would prefer that. I've got that in my notes, so thank you very much. Stand by Mr. Robling and Mr. Cartman. Thank you, Isabel, or Council Member Pete Moss-Smith. Um, so the Land Use Committee met uh, last Wednesday, September, September, <laughs> February, <laughs> February uh, 10th. And um, we heard the sp uh, staff presentation and the petitioner's representative also spoke. And we discussed this rezone, which is uh, part of um, the Century Village PUD and part of another PUD, which is in that same area, approximately at Third Street and State Road 446. Um, and uh, it was referred to us from the Plan Commission with a unanimous approval with one condition, which was to certify the um, tree easement on the south uh, southeast portion of the site. Um, we did have a conceptual site plan that we looked at, but it's uh, just conceptual. The site plan will go through the plan commission at a later stage if this is approved. Um, we had some questions about um, in, whether the environmental commission had weighed in and uh, some questions regarding connectivity uh, once this is developed, whether it could connect um, to the parcel to the west and what the connections would be uh, to 446 and 3rd Street. Uh, we also talked about um, uh, a nearby parcel that's not part of this rezone, but that houses a radio station and a uh, radio tower and whether the rezone would have an impact on, on them. Um, and then uh, we considered also an amendment uh, brought, uh, sponsored by Council Member Bolin, uh, which corrected um, an address in the ordinance uh, and made the title of the ordinance more specific. Uh, so the final, the vote on the um, amendment and the ordinance as amended was 3-0. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont-Smith. 
Um, Mr. Robling, are you prepared to present? Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, this petition for the property located at the intersection of East Third Street and uh, South State Road 446. Um, the 10.09 acres are currently zoned within two PUDs, PUD 70 Century Village and PUD 21 Baker Stevens. Uh, the portion of these PUDs that are within the petition are highlighted here in red. Um, they are mostly undeveloped with the exception of uh, parking areas. Uh, surrounding uses include commercial, multifamily uses, commercial and multifamily uses to the north, multifamily to the south. Um, there's a communication tower and hotel on the remaining portion of PUD 70 to the east, and uh, commercial uses on the remaining portion of PUD 21 to the west. Uh, the petitioner is seeking a zoning map amendment uh, for the 10.09 acres from PUD to mixed use corridor. Um, just a, a brief overview of the site and history. Century Village was originally approved in 1975 and um, was expanded in 2004. The original PUD uh, only allowed for a mixture of limited commercial uses. When the PUD expanded in 2004, it allowed for a maximum of 50 upper floor dwelling units. Baker Stevens uh, was approved in 1984 and remained largely unchanged, allowing for uh, limited commercial uses. Uh, the comprehensive plan has identified the petition site as two future land use areas. The comprehensive plan is aware that uh, this may occur and allows for best suited a best suited designation to be identified and used during the review of a zoning map amendment. The department believes that due to the location along two major corridors that the urban corridor designation best suits these parcels. Uh, the urban corridor has several intense goals and features, including transforming urban corridor areas uh, away from strip mall retail or strip retail and uh, more mixed use urban design. Integrating multifamily residential uses into existing commercial areas, uses should take advantage of proximity to other land uses and urban services. The area should incorporate a mixture of uses and seek to increase activity. Buildings within the district should be developed with minimal street setback, locating parking behind buildings, and an emphasis on minimizing pedestrian obstacles. Uh, the area is also suited for higher density residential and commercial uses and should allow for taller building heights. Uh, site plans are not required as part of zoning map amendments. However, the petitioner has included a, uh, a conceptual site plan in order to give an idea of what the site could be developed with in the future. Uh, rezoning the site to MC would allow for any of the uses in the MC district uh, to be established as long as they met the district standards. Uh, when the current or future petitioner uh, of the already developed the site uh, proposal will undergo a major site plan review by the plan commission. Uh, the review will include location of structures, entrances and drives, architectural elements, uh, environmental requirements, etc. There is a proposed future subdivision on the property that will require the site to dedicate right of way as shown on the transportation plan. This will extend South Morning Drive, Morningside Drive to from East Third to Janet to the south and then uh, extend East Hagen from South Park Ridge Road to Knight Ridge Road. Uh, the petitioner has shown a conceptual site plan which could support a total five buildings, three residential, one mixed use along third and one self storage uh, use uh, on the south. The conceptual plan uh, provides a mixture of one and two bedroom units for a total of 164 units. Uh, this is the conceptual elevation for a potential uh, multifamily building, specifically the one along East Third. Uh, here's the conceptual elevation of the self storage use. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the portions of the PUD are proposed to be rezoned, um, have been largely unchanged undeveloped since 1975, with the exception of some surface level parking. Uh, the comprehensive plan gives guidance that supports a mixture of uses, including higher density multifamily uses along major corridors. Uh, this property affronts along two major corridors in East Third Street and South State Road 446. Uh, the MC district allows for a variety of commercial and residential uses and closely aligns with the goals of the urban corridor designation uh, within the comprehensive plan. 
Uh, the MC district would allow for a variety of expanded uses, most notably multifamily along a heavily traveled portion of the city. And um, just as a note, the department is beginning the process of updating the official zoning map and has plans to expire uh, some of the PUDs within the city, including specifically PUD 70 and uh, 20, or Baker Stevens and um, Century Village uh, and rezone these to base zoning districts. Uh, this petition is in line with the current plans set forth by the department. Uh, so the plan commission voted nine to zero to forward this petition to the common council with a favorable recommendation with one condition, um, which would seek to preserve the existing tree preservation area on the property. And I can take any questions. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Roblin. Um, I see the petitioner did, the petitioner, Mr. Carmen, did you have anything to add? You're muted. There we go. Okay. Uh, no, just uh, one brief comment, I guess. Uh, uh, this has had a couple of public meetings now and, and Ryan's uh, uh, pretty comprehensive summary, I think covered it. I just want to, make the one comment that a little bit in response to some questions asked at the plan commission is that inevitably there are concerns with what's actually going to be built and how it's going to be done. And as Ryan noted, we're not at a stage of, uh, of site plans as required, but questions that were asked before are just, uh, will be addressed in the site plan, whether it's drainage, the connectivity issues, uh, the pre-preservation, and uh, particularly drainage uh, will all be part of, of what will be in the, the uh, developed site plan that the plan commission will have to pass on so that we'll have further public hearing at a later time that's just not part of tonight's petition thank you thank you very much do we have any questions from council members for um, staff or the petitioner council member rollo mr robling I, I'm trying to remember, I don't have the comprehensive plan in, in, in front of me, uh, but the, was this designated a gateway? Uh, this gateway area, to the community? this area is not a gateway, no. It isn't? No, okay. this wasn't uh, one of the urban gateways, I don't think. Let me double check okay. though. All right, that would be helpful. Um, and so uh, Mr. Carmen just referred to further processes of approval uh, based on site plan and, and et cetera. Um, this looks suspiciously like what we saw some mm, a year or so ago, which was a, a, a large student apartment complex on the, on the periphery of the city. Um, would that, would that, uh, be favorable to the department, to planning and transportation, that kind of use? Uh, so sorry, I missed the question. Could you repeat it? Do you recall the PUD uh, that was proposed at this site, I think about a year ago, and it was a large student of development, is, is this, the, this site plan, although I realize it is not, it's conceptual, but it looks to, to be sort of a redux of that. Is that is that something that the planning and transportation department is in favor of? Ryan, I'll I can let, answer that. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Scanlon, Development Services Manager. Um, as you'll recall, we, we recommended approval on that um, request uh, associated with that uh, petition previously. So uh, I don't know, we haven't, because this is a site plan approval, um, done an analysis of this particular request, but something along those lines, I think we think could be appropriate if done properly, uh, like we thought last time. So you're still in favor of it. Thank you. Yeah, if done okay. appropriately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any further questions from council members? Council member Flaherty. Uh, yes. Um, thank you. And I'm going to follow up on a, a question from the committee meeting last week, <laughs> realizing I still don't have a completely clear understanding of exactly what will happen with regard to um, internal roads, whether they're private or or not, and what might trigger um, 
things related to that. I know we had a discussion that if, if um, there is subdivision of properties or parcels, um, that that will trigger um, certain street standards per the UDO. Uh, I don't believe a rezone automatically triggers that sort of thing, nor would I think um, the development of um, you know, a site plan or a set of set of proposals if there's no subdivision of property. So I kind of wanted to confirm first with planning staff, is that accurate that if there's no subdividing of property here, um, none of the UDOs uh, guidance on or requirements on how streets are, are designed or developed will apply uh, to this, uh, to the petitioner, uh, despite despite what's in the transportation plan? Is that a correct understanding? Yeah, so I would say here and anywhere that uh, roads are shown on the transportation plan if subdivisions aren't um, done there, uh, then uh, subdivision is the mechanism which the UDO uses uh, to obtain new r road right of way. So that would uh, be needed in order to get those roads. So here and everywhere uh, that they're shown on the. <clears throat> and just a quick follow-up if that's okay, Mr. President. Um, yes. And, and that's helpful. And I was wondering, so that's specific to dedicated right of way. Uh, what about private roads? Do private roads um, in cases like this have to meet certain standards um, that we have in the UDO or yes, elsewhere? Yes, private roads are built to uh, city standards. Okay. And what makes a private road uh, or a center aisle of a parking lot? It, it kind of, you know, look, I, I realize we just have conceptual plans here, um, but we sort of talked about some of the things in the conceptual plan, some of the um, uh, roadway infrastructure or parking lot infrastructure as roads or potential roads and connectivity. Um, uh, but as Councilmember Volan pointed out last week, there's um, you know pull in perpendicular parking on both sides, and it's a little parking lot esque, a little road esque. And I'm wondering what the distinction is there. Um, I'm just trying to understand, uh, yeah, what will happen yeah. down the road here in terms of any any road or road type development, sure. whether so private they, or public. Yeah, if they do a subdivision here, which my understanding is they are planning to do a subdivision amendment, um, that but and uh, Mr. Carmen can speak to that. If they do a subdivision, then they will have to dedicate road right of way. Uh, and then the roads that are built um, will uh, have to be to city standards. Whether or not they become public roads, I think is a separate question. Uh, I'm not positive on that. Um, we would work with the engineering staff um, on in uh, the Department of Public Works on whether or not we want the you know want those roads. Are they? I'm not positive that all of those that are in the um, transportation plan are required to become public. Um, but they would be built to city standards. If they develop this without uh, any subdivision, uh, they could, of course, um, want to dedicate the road and then do the sub do a subdivision just to do that. Uh, but if they're developing it as one site, then they could develop it as a parking lot, uh, as a faux designed road, uh, and it would just be private a private parking lot. Is Mr. Carmen able to speak to that that series of questions at all? Sure. Uh, the Mr. Brown it will not be the developer of the property. The developer of the property is uh, who proves, uh, did the conceptual site plan that that you've seen is already looking at uh, the connection issues. The uh, transportation uh, plan called for a connection at Morningside Drive, which it, uh, tees into Third Street at the north side, and that's uh, shown in the conceptual plan by relocating the connection on the south side of of Third Street. Uh, move the existing one and realign it with Morningside so it, it's a true intersection there and those match up. Uh, it, the developer's uh, capsule site plan shows taking the, that road through the property down to 446. Now the transportation plan has a very general description of going down to East Janet Drive which is actually south of Knight Ridge Apartments and south of a row of homes. So that becomes more problematic on whether that's really where it needs to run or whether it will tee and go and go east to 446, which is uh, the most likely one. And that plan also uh, that you saw actually showed the connection to the west. Uh, it's There's been no uh, final decision on that issue. That's going to be something to be discussed with staff because in the past there had been some opposition, as I understand it, from uh, neighbors to the west where they wanted a connection what could potentially bring traffic through their neighborhood. So. That's an item to be discussed and, and be resolved as part of the site plan. On what will that west connection be? How, how extensive is a public road or not? There will be a street that will come through the property north to south and get over to 446 at the south end of, the, of this project. 
whether that becomes dedicated as a public road or remains the private road, but as a, as a public street with dedicated as an easement to the public for use as a street uh, is something yet to be answered. There are differences on that. As a public road, it becomes a city maintenance and snow removal obligation like any other city street as a remains as a private road, but uh, as a dedicated to the public as an access and an easement a street through the property remains a private uh, owner responsibility for road maintenance and even snow removal. And so there are some significant differences in which way it goes. From a design and development standpoint, the uh, standards, uh, I believe, are almost the same. I believe there's a, a slight difference in setback requirements on the private street as opposed to being a dedicated public street. I think there's a little bit, of, uh, I think there was a slight difference on uh, setback requirements. Uh, the parking lot is not affected by that. The parking lot would meet other st required standards. This conceptual site plan does not make any attempt to meet the code requirements on parking lot design in terms of tree islands and those spacing and the breakup of the, the asphalt in the parking spaces. So those are issues that just that detail wasn't worked into that conceptual plan. And uh, in terms of the subdivision, uh, there is intent to do a small subdivision off of this. This really is, a, is more of a carve off of that parking area that uh, Ryan, Ryan referred to this exists on now to be to move a lot line and keep that parking as part of what the, the restaurant and banquet facilities that are on the, the developed portion of this to the east. So that would require subdivision and an adjustment lot lines between two lots to be able to do that would qualify as a subdivision. Uh, uh, the question, if I, it's not your question, but if I can respond a little bit on uh, uh, Mr. Rowler's question about the, the uh, prior project. The, the, the day the one you're referring to was was in fact a true student uh, housing developer. This developer is not. Uh, the, that project uh, even went so far as to talk about uh, providing a, a bus service to get uh, the expected student tenant population into campus. There's nothing like that in this petition. These are uh, the multifamily are, are intended to be at this time, and I don't think it's going to change, one and two bedroom, uh, not the three or four or five bedroom, which tends to be more of the student draw. Uh, I don't know if there's any way that any project can exclude students. I'm not sure there's a legal way to do that, but it certainly is not a developer that's that's intended to develop and market for students. So that's not the that's not this developer, it's not a student housing developer. Uh, they've done other projects in the Bloomington area, but they uh, motel and, and other projects. So uh, just by experience, this what, this is not intended to be a student project, but I, I can't say that there won't be some isolated or some number of students out there because it's just the nature of multifamily housing that's likely to happen. But at that distance from campus without a public service, uh, reliable uh, bus transportation in and out of campus, it, it would not seem to be attractive to students to come that far out. Thank you. You have any more, um, Councilman Flaherty? Okay. He's, I do not. Oops. Sorry, had to say. Okay, uh, that's okay. I was. I didn't see your smiling face, and I got a bit confused. I'm so sorry. Um, do we have any further questions from Council? Councilmember Smith. Thank you both for uh, the presentation. And uh, I guess uh, what comes up in my mind is traffic considerations on that you part know, of uh, the, uh, the uh, third street just because third street they just redid it so that people didn't crash over there so um can you can you speak something say something about uh configuring the roads uh, uh where it crosses third street there and any thoughts about um, mitigating the problems with traffic? Well, uh, uh, one, the, the reason for realigning the current entrance that's on the south side of Third Street into the into the Century Village properties with Morningside is to make that improved intersection, which will better control traffic. Uh, there is, of course, the traffic light at 446. This prop property will have uh, this entire complex would actually have two connections to, to State Road 446. There's an existing one now that uh, runs just north of the Century Suisse, and then there will be the new one that I, I think will be part of this plan uh, that will connect it toward the south end of this. And so it gives that traffic option to go to 446 and to be able to go take a left turn up and go to the light at 446. 
if you do the connection with the neighborhood to the west, which is, I think, an open question, that actually carries through to a, a, a city street that gives you another traffic light there. So in terms of traffic that's uh, re reluctant to, to enter onto 3rd Street as a left turn, exiting this property as a left turn, turn westbound on 3rd Street, there'll be other options to, to in a reasonable manner, to get to a traffic signal, a controlled signal if necessary, but uh, otherwise it would be traffic entering uh, from uh, northbound uh, with it. I, I don't know how to better say that. I mean, it, I understand yeah. the, about the improvements to Third Street. I would tell you, some of us who actually live within a very short drive from this in Park Ridge East Me too. Uh, <laughs> would not have voted for the traffic design that we have now on Third Street, but and would have liked to have seen something done with Smith Road intersection years ago. And we're, we're, we're all just still dealing with it. And I don't think that's going to change in their future. So, yeah, well, that, you know, that, that's the reason why I, I asked is, yeah, I live over there too. And it's, it's uh, off and on dangerous and congested and yeah. So um, maybe you, what you're saying, Mr. Carmen, is you think that, that, uh, extension at the uh, off of Morningside might be just a way for to alleviate some of the pressure um, on some of those turns back well, towards the city. I think uh, Jackie or anybody planning transportation would, would agree that offset intersections are inherently unfavored. They, 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 they are set up for problems. So if we're going to have two connections that on the north and south side, we want them aligned. It's it's just a safer design all the way around, so. Yeah, the realignment was uh, recommended in the petition that um, Council Member Rollo mentioned from a few years ago. Um, and uh, that was something that then this petitioner has carried forward, obviously because the same property owner um, to improve uh, uh, in, in and out at whatever may be developed here. Um, and we will work with engineering department staff um, at the time of site plan approval uh, to see, you know, are there other um, things that need to be considered right in, right out only, that type of stuff. Those are the kinds of discussions we have if there are major uh, safety issues, but with two, um, at least two uh, vehicular entrances and exits here, um, likely in a development, uh, that that is obviously a positive also as well, that everyone wouldn't have to be uh, going out uh, west off third west out onto third, um, they could use the other exit and go to the light, uh, maybe something that people would prefer. Again, this is the rezone portion, so we would be dealing with that at the site plan. Okay, Th thank you for answering those questions. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Do we have any further um, questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll go to public comments. Um, on ordinance 21-02, um, I will remind the public if you choose to make a comment, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, or you could send uh, the meeting host a comment through the chat function. I would also like to remind folks that during public comment, if there is more than one person on the same um, device, computer, or phone, please let us know um, so we can take into account any time constraints. So, Mr. Lucas, do you? I, I don't see anybody at the moment, but just a, a point of information there. There was an amendment, and I know it's uh, just a cleanup amendment, but the council might want to consider that before going to the public um, so that the public can comment on the ordinance as amended. I, I know it's just correcting a, an address or two. So, um, I don't know if the committee might want to consider, or the council might want to consider that amendment uh, and give the public a bit of time to indicate whether they'd like to comment. Mr. President? Yes, Mr. Brolin. I'd like to move Amendment 1 to Ordinance 2102. Second. Second. Okay, it's been properly moved and second. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? I'm sorry, there's, is that proper? no need to do that, yeah. So, thank you very much. Um, was that amendment by you, Mr. or Council Member Alden? Yes. Um, is it? it just, okay, go ahead. It, briefly, it adds... Um, uh, the address of the property in question to the title of the ordinance. And actually, I've already forgotten the other thing that it does. And Mr. Lucas, if you could remind me, this was something I agreed to sponsor that was uh, 
I don't remember what the other part of it was. I can't find the amendment uh, in front of me right now. I've got a display oh, shared screen. Yeah. Oh, there you go. It would it would change the title to reflect the addresses of the parcels uh, in question. It would correct an address in section one that was incorrectly listed as 310 South State Road 446. That should be 300 South State Road 446. And it would also revise uh, a different portion of section one to clarify uh, that two of the parcels uh, are further described in the ordinance uh, below. I but they don't have addresses. Correct. Right. So that's all it does. Happy to take questions. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions from council? for amendment one of ordinance 21-02. Okay, seeing none, um, we'll now go to the public for any comments on amendment one for ordinance 21-02. And again, I'll repeat, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom or send us a note in chat to the meeting host. Do you see anything, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll check with you and parliamentarian. Do we need to add this uh, as part of the motion for approval um, as amended? The council should first take a vote on the motion to adopt this amendment. Okay, and thank you. Turn to the ordinance as amended. Okay, do we have any final comments from council? Okay, seeing none, we'll, I'm sorry, council member P. Ma Smith. Oh, I just wanted to thank the staff and council member Boland for catching those errors. Thank you, duly noted. Any further comments? Will the clerk please call the roll please? On petition, I'm sorry, amendment one of ordinance 21-02. Yes, Council Member Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rada. Yes. Volan. Yes. Rosenbarger. Yes. Scambolari. Yes. Sims. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Yvonne Smith? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, amendment one is approved 9-0. Um, I too want to thank staff and council member Boland for um, uh, bringing that to our attention this evening. Um, now back to um, our council staff and our parliamentarian. What is the proper motion with this ordinance as amended? I think uh, at this point we're... Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think at this point we're ready to go to public comment on the ordinance as amended, assuming uh, there are no more council questions. And of course we could still entertain council questions when we come back, so. Thank you. Um, that'll be questions and comments once we come back. So thank you very much for the clarification. Um, we're in public comment. Again, this is on ordinance 21-02 as amended. Um, Please use the raise hand function in the, or in Zoom, or you can send us a note in chat um, to our meeting host. Okay, if anyone wants to make public comment. Seeing none, we'll go back to council on uh, final comment. Yes, this Council is Member a comment Sandberg. and not a question. Um, I do want to thank the uh, petitioner for bringing forward as much detail as as they have, uh, as uh, what's before us tonight is a re an ordinance to rezone the PUD to uh, to the MC, to the mixed use corridor. Um, and uh, just with respect to the project that was soundly defeated because it was overly dense with a student driven project that was 
clearly uh, designed by a, a, um, um, a petitioner uh, that, that was in the market for building student housing. And there were many problems uh, brought up with that. It wasn't what we need in terms of the kind of uh, housing that we need. Uh, it looks like this will be apartments. And the fact that they are one and two bedroom apartments as opposed to those multi four and five, um, I think that will attract the kind of individuals who need that kind of rental housing in that part of town as the hospital site is going to be developed. And um, so uh, looking forward to seeing the site plan when it comes before the plan commission. Happy to approve this, um, this rezone tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or final comments from council members? Council member Bowlin. Thank you. A um, couple observations I have here. One of them is could have been another opportunity to make Third Street into more of a boulevard and less of a highway. Even INDA, which is famously highway happy, saw that this corridor did not need to be so wide or so fast and has painted bike lanes on it. INDOT, you know, of all entities, uh, still surprises me. Uh, I think. I don't. I hope we haven't yet missed an opportunity to slow it down even more. We could, for example, allow parking directly on Third Street, as we debated ten years ago on West Third at Patterson Point. But um, you know, the more importantly, I think we, we're, the ghost of the previous proposal in this project uh, still looms over this area. Um, that project was more than a year ago. It was more like three years ago. Um, and it was a much denser project that would have funded public transit. But because it was student-focused housing and single-family, non-student neighborhoods came from no nearer than a mile away to object to such a project in their neighborhood, it was defeated. Um, it was on a major corridor. It was proposing public transit. Uh, the only thing that mattered was, God forbid, that it should be student housing. God forbid that student housing should be allowed anywhere except in the new zone we have that's specifically dedicated for student housing because students should live apart from non-students. This seems to be the watchword of, I don't know, everyone else I know in City Hall. It's almost like students aren't people. Uh, you know, I, I hope that if there are students watching, Mr. President, I hope that uh, uh, they see that this is how the rest of the city talks about students, as though they are other, as though they are from far away, as though that they cannot be assimilated into our city. Um, I don't begrudge this particular project. It's still, as it's been pointed out, uh, it uh, hasn't been developed in 40, 40 plus years. Uh, the density that's gonna go there is gonna be better. Um, but there was the, the hysteria around the potential student project was entirely out of proportion then and uh, the fact that we're still echoing it to this day, it continues to be a shame uh, on this city. Um, finally, I'd say that um, I'm disappointed a little bit in the uh, change from PUD to, um, to a regular zone. I recognize why um, the comprehensive plan of the UDO are slowly eliminating PUDs, um, that PUDs are still kind of glorified spot zoning. Um, and that uh, that's what we put uh, laws in place in the 70s to, to, to begin to outlaw. But um, the, uh, the, there's, there are times when we could have done even more uh, stronger improvements in a PUD, such as to get a, a developer to commit to uh, an entire new bus line. Um, and we no longer seem to have that ability uh, to negotiate because uh, these special projects are, are going away. Uh, and I'm not sure how, what better way there is to fund buses. We, we know that uh, bus money doesn't grow on trees. And even with the new Biden administration, you know, it's gonna be some time before we can see real commitment to public transit. So with that, uh, with, with those disappointments expressed, I want to wish the developers well. I'm glad that they're gonna be putting something denser there. Um, I'm glad that the apartments are two bedrooms or smaller. Um, that these are all, I mean, and, and I, I think that many people will be surprised 
that students will live here as they will in many other places. With that, I, I recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bolden. Council Member Rollo. Thank you. Uh, well, I certainly don't regret my vote on the previous student housing complex on the periphery of the city. I think that students should be housed closer to campus, frankly. And I think that that was a mistake and it was seen to be, I think, by the, well, by the majority. Um, I think in terms of this, I, I'm, I'm not fully comfortable with, this is a very large parcel. And the potential for this is, is, is large as well. And uh, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the rezone in that what I see is surrendering an oversight role that the council should be involved in, uh, which occurs during the PUD process. Uh, I would prefer that input uh, with demonstrated public good and with uh, a top quality development. And I'm not sure exactly what will occur here. I, I, I suspect that it'll be something similar to what we actually rejected in the past, um, in just a different form. So uh, I'll be voting against this this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Do you have any other Council Member Flaherty? Sure, just a few comments because I'm enjoying this discussion. It's, it's kind of <laughs> bringing, yes, bringing some interesting things up, I think. Uh, first, just um, to note for the public and others that um, we're in the process uh, right now of, of mapping UDO zoning districts uh, that will be probably completed in the next few months. And this area is slated to be uh, sorry, rezoned as mixed use corridor. So um, <clears throat> while not a, a given, it is likely that as part of that process, this PUD and many others will be, will be converted to base zones, just like Mr. Roebling uh, said. But I think what I'm hearing sometimes from council members uh, is that uh, we don't like that <laughs> very much because PUDs um, come, come before the council and are uh, sort of more of a negotiation with reasonable conditions and things. And I, I personally tend to buy in more to the notion that there I believe staff when they say they're a nightmare to administer over time and that uh, we should get away from them. I think my, my answer is sort of, yes, we have less uh, leverage, so to speak, at the council level and probably will hear fewer land use zoning type of questions. Um, but if we don't like zoning rule, the idea is you make better zoning rules, better zoning code and let people follow it. And if we don't like the code and feel like it allows things that we don't like, that's then our duty to, to work with staff to change that and change the change the rules as opposed to negotiating properties that come before us, I guess is, is kind of the the approach instead. Um, but I understand why, why people might have a different view on that. Um, about students and student housing, um, generally, uh, while I kind of share probably Councilmember Volan's general view that, that students are just members of our community and half of it at that and, and sort of belong wherever they'd like to be and, and, and everywhere in every neighborhood. But um, sometimes we hear things like, um, like student housing is like, we don't need more student housing, um, which I get with, with the point of that kind of statement is I think, but the counterpoint is when you add say a thousand bedrooms of student housing is that that's um, a thousand students, if it is in fact students who live there that aren't living somewhere else. Um, if that new housing was not built, those thousand students would be living somewhere and it would be in you know, rental houses or older apartments or other things. It opens up homes in neighborhoods. It opens up older uh, apartment units that might be a 20 or 30 or 40 years old and thus a little more affordable. So even, you know, quote unquote, new student housing um, creates affordability uh, by by opening up opportunities that would not be there but for the new housing. Um, so I think we, we just need to keep in mind in general the, the whole housing ecosystem when we're like thinking about the effect of new housing um, of any type. So I uh, just wanted to put a plug for that. Uh, I'll be supporting the petition tonight. Thank you again to, to staff and the petitioner uh, on all, all their work on this. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have any further comments, final comments from staff, or I'm sorry, council members. Council member Smith. Um, I just wanted to clarify that, so if I understand it right now, what we're doing is we're uh, allowing the mixed use um, and that's, that's what the zoning is. And we will have 
the ability to um, help shape the proposal when it comes to the site planning, right? Uh, no, so, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm I, sorry. Yeah, I, uh, so you won't, uh, it, it won't come back before council because this will only be a site plan approval uh, if this were to be approved. If it were to remain a PUD, for instance, then it would be come back to council. So approving this would make it uh, base zoning, which would just require standard plan commission approval. Okay, thank you. Okay, that answer that you needed, Council Member Smith. Okay, thank you. Um, any further, Council Member Bolin? President, I want a chance to uh, to rebut some uh, thing I've heard, but I want to make sure everyone has had a chance to speak first. Well, I would suggest you go ahead. Um, when we move on, I do have a comment to make, but. Please feel free to go ahead. Well, I'd like to hear your comment before I, I comment. Just Thank you. A po point of order. I saw Councilmember Rosenberger's hand as well, and, and it would Council. be um, it would be appropriate for everyone to make a first comment prior to any any rebuttal. Thank you. I didn't see her hand. Councilmember Rosenberger. It, it's okay. I just flashed it real quick and then thought I would just wait. So um, no problem there. Um, I wasn't able to attend the land use committee meeting last week. I feel conflicted about this. I understand that, you know, in due time, this is going to be allowed. And that makes me think potentially, I don't know, maybe I want to look at changes again to the UDO in some way. I know that's what everybody loves to hear. Um, but I guess I have a hard time with the idea of putting this multifamily in a space for two reasons. One, I feel like it's relatively far away from anywhere people will be going. Like you're not gonna walk to the grocery from there and there's a bus route, but I mean, I think it needs to increase frequency before people rely on it for any type of actual transportation. Yes, there are the bike lanes, but uh, they're scary. Um, two, I like multifamily. I just feel bad that there's public storage units in these people's backyards like I don't see green space here I mean a lot of people will be living here potentially families right if we're really talking about not so many students but there could be kiddos there's like not a playground really nearby I mean you have to cross third street to get to the Park Ridge East playground I think that's, that's got to be at least half a mile I don't know so I it doesn't excite me and it just makes me feel like is this a place people are going to be proud to live and like feel safe living and like I know that's not necessarily like the lens in which this should be viewed and again I know this gets to be built um, just down the road anyway without it being a PUD but I don't, I don't know am I missing anything about green space uh, with this or is that just like not known yet I'm sorry I asked the question set question directed at someone council member rosenberger was that part of your comment well i just i i don't it can just be rhetorical i mean i just i might have missed it and that's okay too so um that's i'm, I'm finished thank you very much um before we go forward we do have the petitioner and staff here is that would you need more clarification I mean, I guess I would ask, is there a place for people to play or sit outside in this hypothetical multifamily housing? Well, the, uh, again, this, uh, this the development plan has not been carved up, but the conceptual plan showed quite a bit of green space uh, down in the Southeast, uh, that's in that area of the, the tree preservation, and there will, there will be other. The landscaping plan has not been done as part of this, so. Uh, that there's that's not shown at all, but there there will be that to come. I I can't speak for the developer with any certainty because I don't. That's just not something that's been discussed at all. But I'm not anticipating there's going to be a playground as such because uh, even when we talk about multifamily at one and two bedrooms, we're not necessarily talking about a a, a lot of families with children either. Uh, possible certainly that that becomes a a predominant uh, a tenant mix, uh, I think, is unlikely. So 
I'm not anticipating playgrounds. Uh, you know, with regard to some of your other comments about walking proximity, whether it's groceries or the Park Ridge, Park Ridge East uh, playground, I mean, there's, there's, everything can't be built within a thrown, stone's throw of, of fresh time. I mean, it's just not possible. And it's already fully developed around that. I mean, unless you're looking to asking the parks board to create small satellite parks at, at every neighborhood, I mean, it's, there's gonna be distance involved. And I don't see any way around that. And this is this is just no different than that, I mean, so. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Roblin, you had a comment? Yeah, I just wanna add one uh, extra point. There is uh, the mixed use corridor district has a 40% a uh, required landscape area. Um, so um, it, that's uh, not stricter than the current PD, it's the same actually, but um, it, so that'll, uh, be maintained moving forward, but they'll have to admit that uh, hit that minimum. Thank you very much. Um, any further comments, final comments? Um, Council Member Rallo, um, actually, I think um, I'm, I'm learning how to go with first, second, or last, and all that. Um, I do have one comment. I don't know if it's proper to do it after the rebuttal, before the rebuttal, around the rebuttal. I'm not so sure what uh, that is, but to make this comment, um, I want to thank staff and um, um, for bringing this petition and petitioner to um, um, explain it to us. Um, I will join Council Member Flaherty and uh, list my enjoyment for this discussion as well. Um, but what I particularly didn't enjoy, and this is just my position, not a, um, um, a, a, a criticism of any comments, but I think it's a mistake to broadly say that many of us on this council or in this city characterize students as non-persons. Um, I, I think that's a gross mischaracterization. Um, I think this council um, and city staff, one of the reasons part of our zoning code and zoning rules and earmarking places that were or properties closest to campus is so that they would be in proximity of campus and therefore uh, better suited for student housing in that particular area. And I, it's my understanding that that's one of the reasons why we did all that in the first place. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. I'm not interested in any debate or more rebuttal, um, but I personally do not consider students non-persons. Um, I worked at Indiana University who, from one aspect without those students, then I'm not so sure I would have had uh, a career. I think many of us there would share that same sentiment. So I just really wanted to say that. Um, I just don't want everyone painted with the same brush because many of us do not share that. Uh, characterization. So, Council Member Volan, you said you had a rebuttal. Yes, and I thank you for speaking so that I can uh, respond to your comments as well. Uh, two points I want to make. First, uh, in case anybody was unsure of one of the ramifications of the UDO, Council is no longer going to have the ability to revise land use petitions as they have in the past as we have in the past because PUDs were that opportunity. So even the largest projects henceforth are going to stop at plan commission. Uh, any negotiations for affordable housing or public transit over and above the narrower charge that the plan commission has are no longer possible. Um, but that you know normally has applied to the largest projects which have almost always been student related and that's the, the other point I want to make. I think I would wager that I'm the only member in the history of this august body that I know of to ever have been a student while serving as a council member. I was uh, finishing my undergraduate in my first term and I finished a graduate degree uh, in the most recent term. Uh, students have been half the population of the city of Bloomington since 1960. Yet there has never been an undergraduate member of the city council. Uh, why does this matter? Well, we're hearing tonight that uh, you know students should be living closer to campus, that this is too far away. But 
the so-called core neighborhoods have vociferously opposed plexes precisely because of their fear of student housing increasing in their neighborhoods, which are the very areas close to campus that I have heard people saying tonight is where students should live. There is an ongoing variation of standard as to how and where students should live. And I don't have any hope anymore of uh, persuading the non-student population of the city to uh, think more holistically about students, to get rid of some of their assumptions about how all students are noisy, sloppy, slovenly, drunk. But uh, because the vast majority of students aren't, and they live among us in all neighborhoods of town, but we're certainly doing everything we can to corral them into certain parts of town, saying that they should live near campus, but really it's they should live somewhere else, somewhere that's not where I can see them because I'm not a student and I don't wanna see them. So with all due respect uh, to the expressions of concern that people have for students, uh, I don't think that any rational student listening to this conversation uh, should, should buy those arguments. It's very clear that we have a de facto effort to keep students in a certain part of town. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bowman. Uh, Council Member Rallo. Well, I don't entirely disagree with Council Member Bowman. I think that as you stated, President Sims, that students have uh, certain needs. One is to be close to campus. And uh, this is certainly not close to campus. So, uh, but I would say that Councilmember Volan paints straw men uh, in arguments as well. And I think that's unfortunate. But what I wanted to just uh, follow up on was Councilmember Flaherty's comments. I, I'm certainly sympathetic, let me say this, that staff uh, go through a tremendous amount of work uh, during a negotiation process for a PUD. And in fact, council has too. Councilmember Volan and I have, have done this. Councilmember Piedmont Smith and others have been involved in that process. And, and the results have been, in some cases, very, very good. Uh, you know, I, Exhibit A would be Hillside and Henderson. It's a very good uh, development that probably should, will be replicated throughout the city or should be. So my concern here is that Yes, it's an arduous process to go through a PDUD uh, negotiation for the public good. It is, this is a very large tract of, of land that's going to be rezoned. Uh, my argument is that it is, uh, the, the real nightmare isn't the negotiation, the real nightmare is a, or I should say a greater nightmare, is a very poor quality development in perpetuity that can't be undone. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. I would just like to state the obvious that in the city of Bloomington, we are a college town. Students have always lived everywhere and students will continue to live everywhere. That's the nature of this community. When over half of our population at times are college students. What the purpose of the plan commission and our planning staff and we as council members have is to provide a balance of housing. And we, when we see a scale start to tip, you're going to hear some pushback and feedback. All throughout the development of the comprehensive plan and the UDO, we heard there's too much student housing here, there. We need to put it perhaps in an area where it's going to be less of a stress or a strain on other parts of the built environment. And may I remind you, we just approved the Brownstone. We're, a, a project is just going up where Motel 6 was along, along the uh, College Walnut um, uh, corridor. So it is not that we are not thinking about the needs for students and their needs to have housing. And we're well aware that they live within core neighborhoods. They live close to campus 
campus in residential areas. Um, and they always will have that choice. And with this project that's being built, anyone can live there. There are not restrictions on whether you're a student or whether you are a single person or whether you are a professional couple. Anyone can live in any apartment that is in this city. And so this, this again, I think I agree with you, Councilmember Rallo, that there are these straw men arguments that people who are concerned about where student housing goes, which is largely driven by the free market, by the way. There is a real market for people to want to build student housing, and that's that's something else that we've got to consider, too. It's not the city of Bloomington building this. It's it's the petitioners. It's people who have the land and people who uh, have purchased that, that land and want to put up what they want to put up there. And so I'm grateful for our opportunities to regulate to the best of our ability through our planning and our, our zones and our codes. But, you know, it's not always up to us as to where people want to want to build things for for the markets that they have done market research on as to what's going to sell. And so, again, I, I, I too, um, resent being um, categorized as someone who doesn't want students to live in certain areas of the town because I accept the reality that they live everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Councilmember Flaherty. Just a very minor point of clarification on, on my um, earlier um, comments with regard to PUDs generally. I, when I talked about being a nightmare to administer, I didn't mean um, the process of negotiating or, or passing them. I meant the, the decades to follow uh, as properties and needs change and we update the UDO and have new zoning codes and new standards for what we think, uh, for instance, roads should look like, but we have an old PUD uh, on the books out west that has probably certain standards built into that PUD that are locked in from the 80s, you know? So it's that type of um, evolution that I think is the nightmare for, for staff. Instead of having rules they know well that they can follow when somebody comes and says, could I do this to my property? They have to dig through the pages of an old PUD. We have hundreds of them in the city. Uh, so that's kind of the argument I was making that I think PUDs generally are not a good practice. And and I guess that's my sense of the planning field generally is that that uh, PUDs are seen as poor planning practice. Um, like, like uh, just, I, and I'd be curious to, to research it more and I'd be happy to read um, research or, or practitioner based, um, uh, you know, arguments to the, to the contrary. Um, so I certainly appreciate um, uh, Councilman Morales and others comments about uh, the good that has come out of, you know, the hard work that the council and others have put into PUDs over the, over time. I, I certainly don't dispute that either. Um, I, I just, uh, I find merit in the argument that we should move away from them. That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, last final comment from council members. Seeing none, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll? And I'm sorry, before you get started, this is for ordinance 21-02 as amended. Ready? Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Council Member Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? No. Bolin? Yes. Rosenbarger? No. Gambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. That is adopted 7 2. And we do have another piece of legislation ready for a second reading. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Thank you, Mr. Roblin. Yep. Thank you both. Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2103 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Um, Councilmember Rallo. Yes. Colin? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. 
Scambleri? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Stephen Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Ben Sandberg? Yes. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that ordinance 21-03 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2103, formerly ordinance 2033, to amend Title II of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Administration and Personnel regarding, sorry, Forgive me, I apologize, I lost my place. Regarding chapter 2.02, .02, boards and commissions revised and chapter 2.04, common council revised. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance is sponsored by council member Volan and would amend portions of title two of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled administration and personnel. The ordinance makes the following changes. It requires that certain information about each city board or commission be maintained on the city's website and revises the process to be followed upon a board or commission vacancy. It revises Bloomington Municipal Code Section 2.04.050, regular meetings, to clarify that the council may schedule its summer recess as needed. It revises Bloomington Municipal Code 2.04.255, committee scheduling, to clarify council committee scheduling and the process of referring legislation to a council committee. It revises Bloomington Municipal Code section 2.04.270, ordinances and resolutions, filing copies and agendas to specify that the council president is authorized to approve the agendas for council for committee meetings convened to consider legislation referred to them. It deletes Bloomington Municipal Code Section 2.04.290, Ordinances and Resolutions, Fiscal Impact Statement Required. Please note this ordinance was revised after distribution in the legislative packet, but before being introduced for first reading at the December 9, 2020 special session. The revision added the third whereas clause, inserted a new Section 4, amended Section 5 to clarify council committees, shall not meet to hear legislation during any scheduled summer recess, and renumbered subsequent sections accordingly. Also note the ordinance was previously introduced and discussed under the former ordinance 2033, but was renumbered as ordinance 2103 and revised with an updated signature block to reflect the new year and election of a new council president on January 6, 2021. The administration committee recommendation amendment one to ordinance 2103 is due pass 310. Amendment two, to ordinance 2103 was due pass 120, and the recommendation on, or, on the ordinance as amended was due pass 210. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member Bowen is also the chair of the administration committee. Um, Are you prepared to give a um, committee? A I'm sorry. I'm point sorry. Of order. Point of order for Clarity. President Sims. Yes. Uh, I move that ordinance 2103 be, adopt be adopted. Second. Thank you. Now we'll go to Chair Bolin if he'd like to give a re administration committee report. Well, I was going to ask you, Mr. President, it feels like a conflict as the sponsor of the legislation and the chair of the committee. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I guess I can, I can I, do that, but it's sort of the same thing. I was going to say my only comment would be uh, a conflict tonight would have been a conflict three weeks ago. Um, so if you're prepared to okay. give a report on the committee, I appreciate it. Well, um, I mean, I can give a report on the committee, but uh, it's uh, I'm not sure how to go ahead with the presentation afterwards, but I'll do what I can. Well, so uh, let me check, let me check with the, I'm sorry, let me check with the parliamentarian. I don't think it's, um, that, that is required to give a report, uh, a committee report. Um, am I correct there? Um, that's something we ask, but if it's part of your presentation, I'm fine with that as well. I um, just want to double check with either our staff or parliamentarian. I'll defer to council staff. I'd have to double check. I mean, we have a committee report that was filed as part of the, the legislative packet addendum. So we, we are all in receipt of that and it, and it is uh, uh, available to the public on our council webpage. As far as, far as um, additional vocal report requirement, um, Mr. Lucas, do you have any 
thoughts? I was going to echo what uh, Councilmember Flaherty just noted um, and uh, state that uh, I, I think Councilmember Volan uh, could uh, relate any additional information if he thought it was necessary from that committee report. Uh, but as sponsor, I, I assume most of what he'll uh, go over in, in whatever presentation he'd like to give would would mirror what, what the report says. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to be clear. Um, uh, being a conflict kind of threw me just for a second. Um, Councilman Bolin, uh, please present. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm not going to, to take up much time here. I think most people are familiar with the contents of this. This is a ordinance cleaning up Title II. Um, it is one of at least two, perhaps three that we'll see this year. I guess this is the year for Title II cleanup. But um, it, uh, it, uh, I began it last fall uh, trying to address some uh, uh, inconsistencies in how the city collectively, the council and the administration have conducted itself with respect to, um, especially the council with respect to code on the books that was, uh, no, that was out of date. Um, sections one through three of the ordinance uh, changed the way that we uh, handle the notification process when there's a vacancy on a board of commission. Um, the last time that uh, we revisited this section of code was 45 years ago. Um, and, you know, media have changed. So um, it uh, removes sort of cumbersome uh, ways to go about promoting uh, uh, vacancies that um, uh, are better done another way. Um, the uh, fourth section of this uh, ordinance. Um, uh, revises 204-255, uh, how we schedule council committees. It gives the president more flexibility in scheduling them in anticipation committee meetings on weeks where we're having uh, legislation referred to committees. Uh, it, it specifies um, that those committees are normally to be held on second and fourth Wednesdays. It removes the requirement that committee of the whole be held at 630 so that they can be scheduled it can be scheduled among regular standing committees. Um, it gives the president the ability to um, anticipate um, the referral to the committee so that it can, uh, it can anticipate the scheduling of committee meetings on a future Wednesday. Um, section five um, uh, gives the council president the ability to approve agendas for committee meetings uh, when legislation is being referred to it. And finally, section six eliminates a piece of code that we have literally never observed in my experience, the requirement for a fiscal impact statement. Um, and uh, uh, that brings me to two amendments that were discussed in committee. Um, the uh, first amendment uh, uh, retains a fiscal impact statement, but removes a requirement that it be done uh, as formally as it was. It makes it uh, less formal. Uh, that was approved by the committee three to one. Um, and the second, uh, uh, let's see if I get this right. It um, eliminates the line in, in uh, Title II that requires legislation by a standing committee to be considered before a motion to refer legislation to committee of the whole. And that was uh, rejected by the committee one to two. Um, so with that, the committee as a whole recommended uh, the legislation two to one. Um, and uh, I think that sort of does both a presentation and summary of the committee hearing. I hope that's adequate for everyone. I'm happy to uh, take questions on the ordinance uh, and the amendments. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, uh, Council Member Flaherty, do I entertain a motion to adopt the amendments now? Uh, I would say that's up to or, or anybody ahead. moving to um, adopt an amendment. We can have some discussion and questions yeah. first, but at any point it would be appropriate to. I'm just looking for amendment. appropriateness. Thank you very much. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I was trying to follow along uh, with the text of the ordinance when Councilmember Bolin was summarizing it, and I, I have seven sections, 
and then the typical, you know, if any part of this ordinance doesn't work, then it doesn't nullify. Oh, I'm else. sorry, we did. So uh, is there something that there was a there's a section about summer recess that I think maybe was missed. I'm sorry, I'm reading from the, the memo. Um, uh, rather than from the, t the ordinance itself. And it's been revised. Uh, Mr. Lucas, can you help here? I think that we, uh, this, this ordinance has been on the books for at least uh, four sessions, uh, four regular sessions. So I'm, I've lost track of, uh, it's become a Frankenstein monster. I, um, it's possible the memo omitted one of the sections by mistake. Let me uh, pull up the Legislation. I think Councilmember Volan is right that the first three sections deal with the uh, board and commission vacancy process. Uh, section four um, deals with uh, the council summer recess, and that may be the provision that was that was missing from the memo. And I apologize if that if that's the case. And that's my bad for not uh, getting the the most recent document. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, so that new section, I, if I'm not mistaken, it uh, uh, it removes the requirement that summer recess be held uh, in August. Uh, for the past six or seven years, we have uh, changed the window of uh, of, um, of when council takes recess, uh, partly in anticipation of um, um, the changing way that the state does budgeting. Um, it, we found that uh, moving recess to earlier in the summer, um, it makes it for a more congenial budget process. Um, but the code and the um, and uh, on the books required that it be August, and we had to make a special exception every year. This simply removes that and allows us to schedule it. I mean, state code simply says that we have to meet at least once a month during the year, and. Um, you know, as long as we do that, we can, we should, we should be able to set our annual calendar to have to take recess whenever we think is appropriate and not in August. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from council member for um, uh, Mr. Boland, council member Boland? Okay, seeing none. Um, I will entertain a motion to adopt amendment. Are we prepared for that? I typically would be, sorry, I know, no, I know the parliamentarian uh, sometimes oh, makes motions for things, but I think in the, in the, um, in the case of amendment, amendments, I, I would typically uh, defer to the authors of the amendments. That's why I wasn't speaking up. <laughs> Oh, no, no, you're fine. Um, I was about to recognize Council Member Piedmont Smith um, and or Scambolari, but Council Member Piedmont Smith was busy writing, so I didn't want to disturb her. Um, is Move Amendment ready? 1. <laughs> Thank you. Thank the you. The ordinance 2103. <laughs> <Second. laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's been moved and second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Oh, there's no need for that, is there? No. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah, uh, as a point of order. No, we can discuss and then vote on Discuss, the okay, thank you. Um, can you please present um, either Council Member Skimbler or Council Member Piedmont Smith? Uh, sure, so um, <laughs> the ordinance as written uh, eliminates the fiscal impact statement. And um, we thought there was value in having a fiscal impact statement, but uh, it was quite cumbersome to, um, to have a separate form with a strict, uh, you know, spaces for for each uh, type of impact and, and things that don't always apply. So um, we uh, have proposed to delete um, or revise section seven entitled ordinance and resolutions dash fiscal impact statement required. Um, and uh, it so the, the new wording would read as follows. All proposed legislation must be accompanied by a statement describing the impact of that legislation on the city's finances, including but not limited to revenues, expenditures, and any new debt obligations. So it, it kind of just simplifies um, that uh, the format in which um, any fiscal impact uh, 
that is maybe expected from uh, legislation may be presented. Thank you very, very much. Um, did you want to add anything, Council Member Um Just to summarize, the, the, this, this amendment would essentially do two things. It, number one, it acknowledges that as a legislative body for the city, we do have ongoing interest in understanding fiscal impact. And number two, it provides flexibility and it would no longer force us to kind of shoehorn those reports into a form uh, that is not particularly flexible. And it, of course, council will always have the option of requesting more information if they wish. So, and that's all. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. We now go to um, um, questions from uh, my council colleagues to the um, sponsors of this amendment. Uh, did I see your hand up, Council Member Volan? Well, I just wanted to re re reply to the amendment as a sponsor Great. of the ordinance. Well, this is the period for, do you, do you have questions or comments? I mean, as the sponsor of the ordinance, I, I thought I'd have a chance to comment on the proposal. I think that would be uh, appropriate, um, President Sims, if... Thank you. Please proceed, Council Member Bolden. Thank you. Um, uh, briefly, I'll say that uh, uh, while I have, I was a bit more bitter in my opposition to this in committee, uh, I have come to see uh, what the sponsors intend here. Uh, I don't think that it's a good idea, but I no longer am so, I mean, I voted against it in committee, but uh, I don't have the same strong objections I did before. Uh, I will say that um, I do have objections and the, the objection is in the nature of a fiscal impact statement. Why would you have one? You would have one because there would be some somehow independent arbiter of whether or not the legislation proposed would have a fiscal impact, whether it's a petitioner bringing a project or it's a council member proposing some change to the administrative state. Um, the thing is that without there being an independent arbiter of whether the, impa the fiscal impact would be or not, I think the effect of the amendment is simply by retaining the uh, a sort of a less stringent uh, fiscal impact statement uh, that it sort of provides a kind of dressing for legislation. But anybody could say anything about whether the fiscal there's going to be a fiscal impact or not. Um, the, if it's the sponsor putting the fiscal impact into the legislation, uh, they could say, well, there's no fiscal impact, even if a council member says that, uh, insists that there is one, another member says there is one. So um, I, I, let's just say that I don't think the amendment will have the intended effect, um, but it's not offensive on its face. I understand why the sponsors would like to uh, keep it, but I, I don't think it's going to work. So with that, um, I'm happy to to hear debate. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the um, sponsors from any council members? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, um, we will now go to public comment. And I would just repeat that members of the public may speak on matters of community concern not listed on the agenda at one of two public common opportunities. I do apologize. I'm reading the wrong thing. This is, I will say this, if you are a member of the public and would like to participate in public comment, please use the raised hand function in chat, or you can send the host a note. Use the raised hand function in Zoom. Sorry, it's been a long week. Or we can uh, send us a note in chat to our meeting host and we will acknowledge you. Do we have any takers, Mr. Lucas? I don't see any, okay. but no. Okay, thank you. I think I should say this is for Amendment 1 on Ordinance 21-03. Okay, still seeing none. Um, we'll return to Council for final comments on this amendment. Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll?
You're muted. Let's try that again. All right. Council member Rowland? No. Council Rosenberger? Yes. Stambulori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rallo? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is adopted eight to one. Um, Mr. Are the President. authors, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Mr. President, I would like to move approval of amendment to the ordinance 2103. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, this is sponsored by council member Scambolari, council member Sandberg or council member Rollo, um, who would begin pre presenting. I can actually begin and then I, I will invite my colleagues to chime in and cover what I miss. So um, this amendment would essentially remove one specific sentence and that's this one. Motions for referral to a standing committee shall be entertained before a motion for referral to committee of the whole and shall include the approximate time at which the committee will convene. Um, when this was originally, when this language was originally shared with us, it was, it was described as language uh, that would essentially force council to try committees, to essentially put a thumb on the scale, so to, so to speak, and nudge legislation toward, toward a standing committee rather than toward committee of the whole. Um, just for context, I am among those who supported the creation of standing committees last year. So I look at them through that lens. Um, it's now almost a year later, okay? Um, council members have had a chance to see committees at work, um, both for act actual legislation and for topics that are not the subject of legislation. Um, we've had a chance to see how they work. We should no longer require uh, a thumb on the scale um, to force them to be sent uh, to a standing committee or to committee of the whole. Um, so just as last year, the president generally elected or decided where legislation needed to go, um, this amendment would essentially allow the president to make those same recommendations. So, or, and one more thing, and again, I'll invite my colleagues to cover anything I missed. Um, it always, it do, in no way takes away council's opportunity to overturn that. So if, for example, the president were to make a referral to one standing committee and council felt strongly it should go to another, they could vote toward that end. Um, likewise, if the president wanted to send something to committee of the whole um, and the council felt strongly otherwise, the council could vote to that end. Um, so council always has that option. This just removes that original uh, edge that would quote force council to try committees. Um, with that, I, I would invite my colleagues to finish what I missed. So, thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Yes, I would also like to note that this also gives more jurisdiction to the president to do the traffic controlling. I always rely on council leadership to help determine um, how best to handle our business, and I think we've seen this year. Uh, with a referral to the Committee of the Whole in which all nine of us voted on the historic designations recently of the core building and the, and the Boxman project. I think that was highly successful. And so what this does is it just eliminates one perhaps unnecessary pr procedural step if the president of the council feels that a matter actually would be better served by all nine of us weighing in on something as opposed to it getting segmented into uh, uh, committees. This is in no way, as, as council member Scambolori has said, eliminates standing committees. We have been about a year into this now. We see how they sometimes work well, how sometimes they're a little more cumbersome than they need to be. And this just simply removes 
moves a step and puts more authority into the hands of the president to determine how best legislation needs to be heard, uh, whether it's all nine of us all at the same time hearing the same evidence and weighing in with our different perspectives, or if it needs to go uh, to a standing committee that perhaps has a little more expertise or a little bit more of a stakeholder um, um, uh, stake in the, in the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Um, did you have anything to add, Councilmember Rollo? I think that sums it up. I, I trust okay. the, disc, uh, the president's discretion in terms of you know, deciding where the legislation should be directed, but it does allow the provision that it could be, that it could be directed by the council if, if needed, or just personal communication can influence the president in terms of uh, the direction. So I trust the president in that respect, just as I trust the president in terms of scheduling. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for those presentations. We will now go to council for comments. Um, council member Volley. I'm sorry, council member Flaherty. Oh, sorry, just a point of order. I know it's a little more confusing when we have council sponsored legislation as opposed to like city staff bringing something, but I think, I think um, uh, it would be, it's in order to, to have the sponsor of the legislation uh, uh, weigh in on the amendment, uh, which I think is what council member Rivolin was intending to do. Um, but uh, yeah, just wanted to clarify, thanks. Please proceed council member Rivolin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I do oppose this uh, amendment. Um, again, the, not as stridently as I did when I first heard it. Um, uh, I recognize the intent of the sponsors to make it a little less cumbersome to, uh, to determine how to uh, take up legislation in what order, setting to what place. Um, I will continue to point out that uh, uh, I keep hearing the phrase about a year. I mean, they've made no, several of them have made no uh, uh, bones about their opposition to committees in general. Um, they even said so tonight. Um, and uh, it seems like they can't wait to uh, undo what we began last year. Nevertheless, uh, uh, despite my opposition to it, it's not the most uh, dramatic change. Uh, it's not the end of the world. I, uh, I disagree with their assessment. Um, but, uh, uh, and, you know, of course, the, this is uh, part of an opportunity to, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. I, I disagree with it. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, but I don't think it's the end of the world. So with that, I'm happy to hear debate. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions um, from Council? Questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the public for public comment on Amendment 2 of Ordinance 21 03. Um, if you're interested or, or would like to make a public comment, please use the raised hand function in chat or in Zoom. I'll get that struck or correct sooner or later in Zoom, or you can use the chat function by sending us a note to our meeting host. Not that I see. Okay, no. thank you very much. Um, we'll now go back to, and normally I, I would go through the ranks let everyone else try to do it. I, I think I'll begin this evening. Um, it seems that there will be um, rebuttal either way, but I'd just like to get it out of the way. First of all, again, I, I want to reiterate, at least from my position, that I do not think that this is a ploy to undo the committee, the standing committee structure. I, uh, uh, and I commend Council Member Scambler, who says she was one of the people who supported them uh, about a year ago. Well, I was one who did not. And as the new president, if it was my intent and, and try to garner support for that, then trust me, we would have done that or attempted to do that 
as opposed to coming up with hybrid um, structure of standing committees and me reaching out to each and every council person to get their ideas and what they would like to see as part of this structure. Um, that's the, the, the one comment. The next comment is at the beginning of this presentation, um, uh, Council Member Volan, as part of his delivery, says, with, with regard to this amendment, that it was rejected one to two. Technically, I cannot debate that, that characterization. The reality of the matter is the vote was one to two. There was three of us on, I'm sorry, four of us on that standing committee. I was not able due to some personal um, uh, uh, schedules to not be there. Had I been there, I would have voted to support this. And then that vote would have been two to two. It don't really matter. It don't change the characterization of being rejected. But I, I thought that came across a little too strongly initially. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, do we have any other comments or rebuttals from my council member, council member Flaherty? Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate the, the discussion we had about this at committee and very good point, uh, Council President Sims. I, I guess, um, uh, yeah, one two, a one two vote when, when a member isn't not able to be there isn't isn't exactly a, a a strong rejection. I'm not even sure I would characterize it that way. Um, I, I, I voted against it, uh, and I plan to tonight. Um, I think either way, um, the ability of a majority of council members uh, to send any piece of legislation to any committee of its choice is preserved, uh, whether this amendment passes or not. I, I really didn't see it as a, as a, a thumb on the scale or, or a way to force uh, things to go to committee. And especially with this, with this um, legislation bringing the ability for a preliminary referral or sort of presumptive referral into the, into the purview of the president, um, you know, we'll sort of have that preference in hand uh, in the future. More, more so, my opposition has to do with my continued belief that we're not using committee of the whole correctly. Um, and I, I finally um, read the full Roberts Rules section on that. Um, if, if my colleagues haven't, I, I, uh, or haven't done so recently, I, I would urge you to do so. Uh, in my 11th edition, it's pages 529 to 538. And it's just ver very plain that, <laughs> that how we use committee of the whole is not how that um, parliamentary process is intended to be used. I don't... Speaking of, of the matter objectively, like if I shared the views or, or reasons my colleagues who are maybe somewhat, somewhat some of my colleagues who are somewhat opposed to these standing committees uh, by this body, uh, if I shared their perspective about the desire for all nine members to hear um, all pieces of legislation, I think the appropriate way to do that would be through first and second reading, and if needed, a third reading. Uh, I don't think we should be going to committee of the whole uh, to do that, again, because it's not how Roberts intends that to be used, and also because um, I think there are other negatives in terms of how the public understands what is a council meeting and what is a committee of the whole and, and other such things. So I'm all for uh, having all nine members hear some, some pieces of legislation. I think that's totally appropriate. In fact, if we go back to a system where that's all we do, that's okay too. I'm happy to work in that uh, structure, but I, but I would urge us to, to do so through regular sessions um, and if, the, and if the schedule gets busy enough, we need special sessions to, to help supplement, that's, that's okay too. I just don't think we're, we're um, I think we should get away from using committee the whole for the reason that, that uh, yeah, it's, it's, we're not using it properly basically. And that's, that's why I'm against this amendment because I, I'd rather see a, a bro broader structural shift there. Uh, so that's it, thanks. Thank you. Any further comments from Council Member? Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I'm also opposed to the amendment. I feel that um, the, the default should be to go to a standing committee. I mean, the, the benefit of standing committees is that we, we have, can specialize and we can focus on certain areas of expertise. And, um, and I think that is better served by, you know, having legislation when it's, it's uh, almost all legislation clearly falls within one of the categories of the standing committees. Um, and, and so I think that that should be the default. That should be the first consideration. Let's first consider 
whether it's appropriate for a standing committee. Um, now, there are uh, unusual occasions, such as with the Historic Preservation. We don't have you know, a Historic Preservation Standing Committee, um, and it wasn't really housing because it wasn't residential. So um, it, there really was no good fit for those um, pieces of legislation. So I think it was appropriate that we sent those to the Committee of the Whole. Um, so I, uh, I just think that the Standing Committee system is a good one. And so uh, consideration to send legislation to a standing committee, I think should come first. Thank you. Any council member Smith? I just wanna come out and say, I, I, I support the amendment and I, I think I support it on the same grounds that um, when we first came to the council that I was worried that the information would become fragmented across the standing committees. And I still believe that that, that occurs. Um, and I kind of think that the less number of standing committees we have, the better, because then we all debate it and we all see the information and we all hear the argumentation both ways and we can make a good decision that way. I, I, I have to admit, I've, I feel somewhat isolated sometimes doing standing committee activities. Um, and, I, and I realized that perhaps we would develop expertise, but I also think that the council members um, that are on uh, the council right now who have had years of experience looking at different topics, really, uh, uh, it's really, really valuable to have them uh, opine in it when we see it. And, and then, it, then we do seem to, I feel that we repeat some of the information and perhaps give the city staff another meeting to go to. So I won't, uh, I will be supporting the amendment that uh, gives the purview of, to the president of the council. Um, so thank you. Thank you, council member Smith. Do we have any other comments from council members? Okay, council member Volan. Thank you. Um, uh, I think, Mr. President, had you been present at committee, uh, uh, it was still, as it's been pointed out, um, and you voted again, uh, in favor of the amendment, it would have been two to two. Uh, it does take three votes for something to be approved by a committee. Um, but now we're quibbling about a word that I didn't even think about that hard. I used the word rejected. I didn't do it with any malice. Um, uh, if there's some other word that people would prefer, such as uh, defeated, uh, maybe turned down is gentler. Um, but I mean, I, I'm sorry, I find some of my colleagues' sensibilities to be a little um, off-putting that they're, that they're put off about something as little as an accurate word to describe that it was not, did not find favor in committee. Um, I, a couple months ago, I issued guidance on how to think about committees, this is mostly for department heads. Among other things, I pointed out that um, the, you know, the committee members should be prepared for a meeting and they shouldn't require a full presentation. They should be able to get right into the conversation of an issue. Um, I would strongly urge my colleagues, such as Councilmember Smith, who uh, pointed, you talked about uh, knowledge being fragmented across, across standing committees, but this was the case before we had them. This was the case with nominating committees. This was the case with the existing Senate committees we had for years, like the Hopkins Fund and the Sidewalk Fund. There's no difference here. Um, and uh, so, you know, I don't think that his uh, concern holds water. Um, I think that uh, uh, I also want to point out that in that memo, as in the legislation where we uh, uh, first set up this system, um, years ago, before we even passed standing committees, we uh, passed 
uh, ordinance that said that when legislation is referred to standing committee, we must schedule the meetings to be consecutive so that should people want to attend, they can attend. That's been available. We've, we've got, been over backwards to make sure that every member could attend a standing committee meeting. Uh, if a member wanted to be in on that discussion, they could have been present in that meeting. Um, so uh, I just uh, continue to find that to be mystifying that that's an objection. Councilmember Flaherty's solution is the way to go. If members think that it's better for us to deliberate as nine on every issue, uh, we shouldn't need standing committee at all. We can do it all in regular session and we should be doing it in a regular session. I agree, I don't object to all of us taking up issues. Uh, but I mean, standing committee is literally, Robert says it's literally meant, or a committee of the whole rather, is meant for assemblies of 50 to 100 people. It's meant for large assemblies. It was never meant to be used in the way that we've been using it. I continue to insist on that. Um, and that I would strongly urge my colleagues to consider, uh, you know, how we can uh, move discussions that require everybody to third readings, uh, but to do it at regular session when minutes will be kept, when a uh, formal debate will be noted. Um, but lastly, I'll say a super majority has always been able to steer the council long before we put these rules in place. Even in defiance of a president to whom they would otherwise delegate authority to schedule meetings. So, uh, you know, this is ultimately a matter of preference, how we prefer to see things scheduled. Um, and that's why I, I can't be as strongly opposed to it as I was when I initially saw it. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I still think that, um, you know, uh, some of the people who are supporting it uh, are simply, you know, this is an opportunity to, uh, the, this amendment rather, is a continued opportunity to attack the premise uh, of standing committees altogether. And it continues to boggle my mind that we are debating this as much as we are. So I oppose the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other comments? Okay, I'll take a crack at it. Um, one of the things that's important here, I don't think it really matters what goes first um, with regard to referrals. Um, I just think that it's better, me being the president, to at least have that to be the first consideration as opposed to forcing standing committees to be the first consideration. If in fact I, for an example, I, uh, uh, or the leadership I should say, referred ordinance 21-02 to the land use committee. Had this council said, no, Jim, that's not a good idea or leadership, then we still have the, the ability and the power to overturn that to direct it elsewhere. So, I mean, I think we're kind of quibbling on, on some other things. Um, so that can be undone. I think also uh, past presidents know this, and this has increasingly become more of an issue, is with the council scheduling and the agenda as we move forward. So that has to be massaged. And uh, I don't want to say creative, but there has to be space that has to fit. Um, and also taking into account some of the comments I've heard from other council members with regard to their feelings and their learning curves with regard to the committee of the whole. Um, I do want to say with the term rejected, I don't want to focus on that as much. I just simply wanted to, and I think I said technically that was correct. I do think I said that. But what I'm saying is, I don't think the, with the tone that was used, in particular with our um, emphasis on collegiality and, and respect, those sorts. Of, I think the tone that was used, the public is not aware of that. And that can, as we've said before, words matter. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. Um, last two points. We had suspension of the rules last year with the, with the president with regard to referring legislation. And I think that ended at the end of last calendar year. Um, in my discussions with, um, in, in our council scheduling and with our um, council staff, 
then I simply wanted to do the same thing that the president was doing last year, but I was not allowed to do it because the rules that had been suspended were no longer in place and the rules changed. So, so the rules changed while we were playing the game. So, and also I think it's different. Um, I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. That's the way we're trying to operate now, pardon? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Just, trying to order no, some dinner for myself and I interrupted. <laughs> that's okay. Um, order for your colleagues as well. Um, but I think um, it, it just feels different than the way we operated last year. Um, and last, I will say this. Roberts may have never intended the Committee of the Whole to be used. And I can appreciate that discussion. I would love to have that with council leadership as we move forward, in particular our parliamentarian. But it's interesting to me that we say Roberts have never intended this, but this has been the process for as long as I've been following city council meetings. So if that was never the pro <laughs> the intent, well, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. If it's not the intent now, was it the same intent 10 years ago or two elections ago or the last election? Um, so I get a little bit confused and I will have um, discussion with our parliamentarian to move forward and hopefully we can streamline it so it is the most efficient and effective process that we have. So um, that's the end of my comments. Do we have any other final comments or um, I feel a rebuttal coming on? Um, no more comments. Council Member Volan. Yes, uh, I'd like to point out the history of this ordinance. It used to be Ordinance 2033. There, this ordinance makes several other changes precisely to give the president more flexibility in scheduling, among other things. I would simply refer uh, you, Mr. President, and my colleagues to the text of the ordinance outside of this amendment. Um, I would remind you that uh, uh, it would came forward on December 2nd. I had hoped that it was uncontroversial and that it could be passed in one cycle. Uh, we had an objection, and so it came into the new year. And since then, we sent it back to committee. This We've had this longer than uh, a cleanup ordinance should, uh, should, should be held by council, to be honest. So, uh, but I just want to say, in defense of Ordinance 2033, that it was designed precisely to do the thing that you now lamented that... Uh, you know, the rules expired. Well, I was trying to fix that. Um, and we're still hanging on to it in February. Um, I, I think that I, some of the comments I've heard from my colleagues uh, just underscore the, um, the sort of arbitrary observations they make about, I mean, it, 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 they've made it very clear, uh, and you, Mr. President, have made very clear that you were not in favor. You, you remind uh, us of it uh, with regularity, that you weren't in favor of this of uh, this system in the first place. Uh, I'll point out once again that Robert's rules is by city code what we follow when city code is silent on how to manage process. Uh, and Robert's is accepted around the world as the standard for managing parliamentary procedure. Uh, I only point out that Committee of the Whole is an afterthought in Robert's rules uh, because uh, uh, I, it just seems so self-evident. I can't even uh, talk about it. Um, the, uh, I've lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Um, I just, uh, you know, the, the rest of this ordinance is fairly decent. Uh, the fact that I oppose this and the reasons why certain members support it uh, is continuing a debate that uh, I did not intend to have, let alone for as long as we've had it. And I fervently wish that we can move on uh, someday. Uh, I would like to point out also that the administration is preparing its own Title II ordinance. It's coming forward in March. Uh, and when the Novak group is done studying boards and commissions, we're going to have yet another Title II. We're going to have literally three Title II pieces of legislation in one year. It's high time that we revisited it, but never intended this ordinance 
to uh, go on as long as it has. And, you know, these, these amendments came forward, uh, you know, and this, please don't misinterpret this word, but they were opportunistic. Um, you know, like here, if I hadn't brought a Title II amendment for uh, ordinance forward, there wouldn't be these amendments. So, uh, you know, I, like it, this, the schedule of this ordinance was not my doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that comment um, slash rebuttal. Do we have any other final comments from council staff? Okay, seeing none. Um, will the clerk please call the yeah. roll? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, council member Scambler. Hi, um, yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I almost missed you, I'm sorry about that. No, that's fine. Um, more than anything, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, all of you clearly have thought deeply about this, um, perhaps even deeper than it was intended. We had it. We've already kind of this evening morphed into a discussion of the merits of committees, uh, which this amendment was not intended to do. Um, but I do appreciate the thought you have given to to this issue. Uh, and again, please know what it is intended to do. It is to allow us to move legislation in an expeditious way. Uh, and what it is not intended to do is it is not intended to kill committees or anything like that. Um, so I just want to do that. I want to make that as clear as I possibly could. Um, and again, thank you for your consideration. So thank you very much. Okay, final final comment from staff. Okay, seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? I'm sorry, Amendment 2, Ordinance 21-03. Thank you. I know you got it. I have to remind myself. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Council Member Rosenbarger. No. Scambolari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? No. Piedmont Smith? No. Smith. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Rallo. Yes. And Volin. No. Thank you. Thank you. Amendment two was adopted five to four. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for presenting and thanks for all the robust debate. Um, now, just so that I'm clear, Mr. Parliamentarian, we now go to the full ordinance as amended. Correct. Thank you. And the ordinance 21-03 as amendment, as amended, uh -huh. we will go to council for um, any questions or comments on the ordinance as amended. And just a point of order. Correct? Yes. Yeah, I, I believe we will need to consider public comment on the ordinance as amended at some point. We could do that now or after additional questions. On the, on the ordinance as, re, as, thank as you. Amended. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, do we have any council comments? I'm sorry, council questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll go to the public for public comment on ordinance 21-03 as amended. Um, I will remind everyone to uh, please indicate your intent to comment by using the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can send our meeting host a note in chat to be recognized. Do we have any takers, Mr. Lucas? I don't see any, no. Okay, we'll give it just a second. Okay, seeing none, go back to council for final comments. Any final comments? Ordinance 21-03 as amended. Okay, uh, Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. 
Yeah, um, I meant to say this uh, earlier when we were talking about Amendment 1, but um, I do want to acknowledge uh, what Councilmember Boland said that um, that uh, the fiscal impact statement um, process is, is still not ideal. Um, ideally, we would have a, a general accounting office that would be independent that could assess yeah. the actual uh, um, uh, fiscal impact without any bias. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have that. So uh, I, I still think, of course, since I sponsored co-sponsored the amendment and voted for it, I, I still think it's better to have that in our code, uh, if, if, if only as a reminder to us to keep in mind uh, what fiscal impacts are. But, but I recognize it's not ideal. So I just wanted to say that. And I wanted to thank Council Member Volan for bringing this ordinance forward. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. Sure. Yeah, just very briefly, also wanted to thank Councilmember Volan for uh, his work and staff for their work um, and council members for their consideration of amendments and other things uh, as we continue to work on, on our administrative processes. So I think it's important that we keep revisiting these things and I'm glad we are. So thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I also um, wish to thank Councilmember Volan for bringing that forward. Um, many times when we uh, have a discussion on an item, we will not always agree. We will um, have some agreements. Um, it is just nice that we can disagree without being disagreeable. And that's what I appreciate. And I think we all learned something from that debate. Um, so if we have no more final comment, Council Member Volan. Yes, I'd like to thank uh, staff for their support in uh, developing this. Um, uh, Stephen Lucas, Heather Lacey and uh, Becky Bustani. Uh, they've been very helpful over the past uh, three months that we've been trying to uh, navigate this arcane and dated piece of city code. So I appreciate their help. Thank you. Thank you. After seeing no further comments, are we ready for the question? Will the clerk please call the roll? On 2103 as amended. I'm sorry, 21-03 as amended. Thank you. Yes, Council Member Scambolori? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ordinance 21 03 as amended is adopted 9 0. And we do move into first readings. And we do have legislation for first reading. Mr. President, I move that ordinance 2106 be introduced and read by title and synopsis by the clerk. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Dean Mount Smith? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was adopted 9 0. It has been moved and seconded. Um, to be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2106 to amend Title II, Administration and Personnel of the Bloomington Municipal Code regarding adding Chapter 2.87, Protections for People Experiencing Homelessness. The synopsis is as follows. 
This ordinance is sponsored by Council Member Flaherty, Council Member Rosenbarger, and Council Member Piedmont Smith and amends the Bloomington Municipal Code to add a new Chapter 2.87 entitled Protections for People Experiencing Homelessness. The, cha the new chapter includes procedures to be followed by the city before displacing individuals experiencing homelessness from certain public spaces. The procedures applicable to the city would include a, a notice requirement collaboration with relevant service providers, a prohibition on displacing individuals if there is insufficient available housing, storage of personal property, and the ability to designate certain limited areas where these procedures would apply. Note, this ordinance was revised after distribution in the legislative packet, but before introduction at the regular session on February 17, 2021. The revision corrected a reference in the definition of camp to section 030G. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move into additional public comment. Um, I will remind members of the public that they may speak on matters of community concern not listed on the agenda at this, the second of the comment opportunities. Um, Obviously, citizens may speak at one of these, but not both. Um, speakers will be allowed five minutes. This time allotment may be reduced by the presiding officer if numerous people wish to speak. Um, do we uh, also, I'm sorry, I'll remind everyone that if you would like to have a public comment, please use the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can send our meeting host a note on chat and you will be recognized. Okay, Mr. Lucas, I see one. Yes. At, pre at present. Before we go to the public, I, I wanted to check with the council to see if um, it wanted to uh, make a referral of that ordinance um, that was just introduced um, to any particular committee. That was my mistake. I should have uh, ca called out a point of order that we should entertain um, a, a, a motion to uh, refer to a standing committee. And if no motion is to be made, uh, to entertain a motion to refer to committee of the hall. So my apologies. Well, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, on next week's schedule committed, uh, I would prefer to refer this to the committee of the whole. Um, I think it's robust and would be very efficient and effective for all nine of us to, to um, deal with this legislation at that time. Um, uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Um, I believe we have to uh, first consider referral to a standing committee since even though the ordinance we just passed is not actually law yet. Am I wrong, uh, parliamentarian? No, that's correct. We should entertain a motion to referral to a standing committee. I don't think it was improper, though, for President Sims to state his preference uh, prior, prior to doing so. Uh, and by entertaining a motion to a standing committee, we don't actually have to have a motion made or vote on it, uh, only if a member would like to make such a motion. Um, as, so as long as there's a, an opportunity to do so, that would uh, satisfy code. Right. I was going to do so. <laughs> Great. I'm just clarifying that uh, since we had some confusion over that particular matter um, a few weeks back. Council Member Bowling. Yes, Mr. President, I move that Ordinance 2106 be referred to the Public Safety Committee. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, that this be referred to the Public Safety Committee Ordinance 21 06. Um, do we go to again council comment? I'm um, sorry, Clerk Bowden. Did you want to include a date and time with that with that motion, for, uh, Mr. Volan? Uh, I would uh, include uh, to, to meet. Uh, next Wednesday, the 24th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Um, 
Council Member Flaherty, is this still council questions, comments, and then public? Uh, uh, no, just debatable for the uh, motion. Thank you. So we could discuss, but no public comment. Thank you. Um, I see Council Member Pete Ma Smith with her hand up. Yes, I, I just want to um, remind uh, my colleagues that the uh, Public Safety Standing Committee did have a hearing on the homelessness issue a few weeks ago. We heard many members of the public express their concerns. And so I think it is appropriate to follow up on uh, after that meeting with uh, this legislation, which, which is also about homelessness and addresses uh, many of the issues that were raised that evening. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. Um, sure, I, I see a lot of merit in, in what Council President Sims suggested of having the all nine members um, hear it, but by the same token, I also sort of anticipate that we will see some amendments to this ordinance, um, whether brought by the administration um, and, and looking for a council sponsor or by brought by council members, just knowing that this is a, um, a contentious issue and that the administration um, generally opposes the ordinance. I think, I think the benefit that standing committees give in terms of the time uh, to develop amendments and not just be hearing them at, at second reading uh, for the first time is maybe um, a good a good benefit uh, for this particular ordinance. But I think, uh, so on balance, I think for that reason, I, I, I think a standing committee is a good idea. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. As a member of that standing committee that has already heard a great deal, I do think it is time to extend this conversation to all nine of us who were duly elected. Um, this is very, very important, and I think um, all of us need to weigh in as soon as possible and have the opportunity ourselves to make any amendments that may be deemed as, you know, essential. Thank you. Council Member Bolin. Uh, referring something to a committee does not make it less important. But what Councilor Flaherty said applies. It does tell the public that the council is deliberating specifically on potential changes to any proposed legislation. We all know how hard changes are to manage. Uh, they take time to develop. Um, to have a, a four member committee that's specializing in this topic and can uh, make space for whatever amendments come forward uh, you know, that's part of the value proposition here, but let it, let no one think that somehow because we're referring to a standing committee that, that this is anything less than a piece of legislation of the utmost importance, please. Thank you. Council member Pete Bell Smith. Yes, I, I just wanted to point out um, and reassure colleagues that even colleagues who are not on the Public Safety Committee can bring an amendment for the Public Safety Committee to consider, uh, just like I did with uh, Council Member Scambellari for the Administration Committee. I, I'm not on the Administration Committee, but uh, I was able to, to bring that amendment. Thank you. Any further, Council Member Rallo? Uh, just to say that referring, of course, this is self-evident, but referring to a standing committee excludes five members from debate. And I think that this is uh, sufficiently important to uh, include the entire body. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Um Just a, a question that I would have for our parliamentarian or for Mr. Lucas, whoever is more appropriate. Um, if this were to be referred to committee of the whole, and then we moved from that to second reading, we could move to it. Would we still have the option of moving to a third reading if we wanted to slow the process and, and spend more time on amendments? Yes, of, of course. And you could also re-refer to committee of the whole. Um, it, it's, okay. um, it's possible. Okay, that was that was my understanding. And I think it's important just for the public to know that, that um, just as referral to a committee does not, a standing committee does not diminish the importance of legislation, referral to committee of the whole does not preclude amendments and just steamroll it through either. So I think we need to be honest about both those things. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and my comment before the vote, or actually there could be more after that. Um, my preference as president of this council to refer it to the committee, the whole uh, was part and parcel as also as chair 
of the Public Safety Committee. Um, and I just particularly would like to add that to this conversation. So do we have any further comments? Okay. Um, will the clerk please call the roll on the motion to refer this to the Public Safety Committee next Wednesday? Um, yeah, next Wednesday. Uh, the date would be 24th, I think, at 6.30 p.m. Yes, of course. Um, let's see, we're starting with Councilmember Flaherty. No. Wait. I meant yes. Apologies. Um, so yes? Yes, on this motion. Okay. Um, Pete Smith? Yes. Smith? No. Sandberg? No. Rallo? No. Roland? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scambalori? No. And Sims? No. Thank you. Um, that motion fails four to five. Um, Mr. Parliamentarian, is it now proper that that um, ordinance is referred to the Committee of the Whole? Uh, yes, I believe. Or do we, we have to do we have to make another motion for that? Yes, we should move to refer to Committee of the Whole. Mr. President, I would like to move that Ordinance Twenty One Hundred Six be directed be referred to Committee of the Whole to meet next Wednesday, the twenty fourth, at six thirty p.m. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Before we take a vote on it, Mr. Lucas, um, do you see any particular conflicts on next week's committee week schedule? I'm sorry, I don't have our paperwork in front of me. This is the only uh, item of legislation that would be uh, discussed next week. Um, okay. There may be a, a report that is ready for uh, presentation to the council, although I think we're still working with that. Uh, Board of Commission to, to iron out a date. So um, uh, at this time, I don't see any conflicts. Okay, gotcha. I, I, I was waiting on the details of the other. So thank you for that. Um, will the clerk please call the roll, please? Just a moment, please. Okay. Um, so, Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yes. Smith? Will you clarify the ordinance for me? You're uh, referring 2106 to Committee of the Whole. Yes. Thank you. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Sorry. Yes. Volan? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That um, referral uh, passes 9-0. Um, thank you all very much. We will now go to additional public comment. Um, I will remind uh, the public that this is for a maximum of 25 minutes uh, has been set aside for this section. Um, this is also for matters concerning uh, of community concern, but not items on the agenda. Um, if you would care to, please indicate by using the raise hand function in Zoom or indicate by sending a note to the meeting host via chat. Um, do we have enough to stay within the time limit, Mr. Lucas? I just see three. That's all I see as well. I've not received any requests over chat. Thank you. We can begin. I believe first up is Nathan Mutchler. 
who should be ready to comment. Thank you. Hi, Nathan, I, uh, you have five minutes. Yes, uh, okay. thank you. I had originally raised my hand thinking to comment on the first reading of legislation. Um, I'm glad to see that that is moving forward and um, hope that the council continues to treat it with urgency and work towards its eventual passage. That's really all I had to say. I wanted to thank the sponsors of that bill for bringing it forward and um, look forward to continuing the discussion about how to strengthen that resolution. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Who do we have next, Mr. Lucas? Next up is Lisa Funkhauser, who should be able to unmute. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. You, have, you have five minutes, please. Okay, thank you, Council. My name is Lisa Funkhauser. I am the president of the Bloomington Board of Realtors. Um, we had several questions about this uh, ordinance, and I don't know, to be honest, you have all just flat worn me out, and I don't hardly know where to, where to begin here, but um, I don't know if this is the correct time to ask questions or will you all explain the different points of this further as you go along in your discussion? How will that work? Um, I'm not so sure what well, you're referring. This is, this is for public comments. Um, are you looking for next steps? Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm referring to the ordinance 2106 um, concerning homeless individuals. Um, I, on item number G, uh, letter G, it discusses that the city may designate certain limited areas uh, on public property. Hey, hey, Lisa, if I may, um, then we're getting into debating on something that's on the council. Uh, I will share with you that it will be next Wednesday at 630. Um, we'll take that matter up in the committee of the whole ordinance 2106. So you will go through each one of these points and kind of explain them better at that point? We will, yes, we will debate the um, that legislation. Yes. Okay. All right, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next up is Nicole Johnson. Good evening, Nicole. You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm. I first of all, I'd love to thank the drafters of the legislation um, uh, that is was introduced today, and I look forward to the discussions ahead on that um, in various committees. Um, I do think it's interesting that the public safety committee the members of the public safety committee, all but one anyways, the new um, one, but all of the members that were on the public safety committee when we had the homelessness, um, the meeting about a homeless issue, um, chose not to um, look at that in a smaller segment. Um, they seemed so, in, I mean, you all seem very interested in that enough to hold a meeting for it. So that was just interesting that you wanted, um, you didn't want to deliberate that on a, on a closer level. Um, on la larger comments, I just want to say, Bloomington has been in the housing crisis for 50 years. Not something I haven't said before, not something we don't know. Long and the short of it is, is that I'm sorry. I just got completely distracted by real life in my <laughs> current <laughs> my current establishment or my current location. I do apologize. Um, anyways, uh, the the larger issue is just just generally like why we can't access the FEMA money. And I and I realize that this is a county issue on some level, um, and that it needs to go through county issues and stuff, but you guys are the city, and I know that the city has coffers for public safety emergencies, and FEMA is currently reimbursing all uh, hotels for individuals who are high risk at 100%, and um, all houseless individuals 
all individuals experiencing houselessness are high risk for COVID according to the CDC and qualify for that. So if we could just figure out how to liquidate some, you know, or to, to make some money of current available, we do have an organization in town called H4H with the infrastructure already in place in order to see that this happen that this is happening. They've already taken on emergency cases due to the weather. Um, and then we'll continue to do what they can um, as needed as a small organization. However, it, the city could absolutely empower this, this community organization to provide for all of our residents, bare necessities. And, and I was in an earlier meeting today with Forrest Gilmore and a couple of other individuals um, with the College Democrats. It was a panel talking about homelessness. and, and uh, Forrest made a really great point, and it and, and it's about like you know the 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 way that we look at housing as a commodity as opposed to a human right, you know, a basic human right. And there's large parts of the world that that look at housing as a human right. And and um, FEMA has empowered us on a local level by county and uh, to make those choices. And so I would really, really appreciate if the members of the Bloomington City Council do what they can to um, show the world and show Indiana and show um, all of the people who live in our community that everyone is important and everyone deserves housing um, and that you somehow figure out how to get, um, you know, the United Way, who is in charge of, relief, of of distributing the funds, and D. Owens, the woman who writes the grants, and the county commissioners who have to approve all the FEMA grants, and the city who has the money. They have the money sitting in some account, and h for h has the infrastructure. Please house our neighbors. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Okay, then we will attend to matters of council schedule. Yes, um, thank you. I uh, wanted to bring a few items to the council's attention. The first is that there is a scheduled work session for this Friday, February the 19th, um, that would be held to uh, hear items that may be ready for introduction at introduction or action by the council at the March 3rd regular session. Um, I'm interested to hear if council members can attend uh, this Friday's work session and which of the uh, potential items uh, you may like to hear about. Um, the items that may be ready for council uh, action include uh, two resolutions. Uh, one is the CDBG funding recommendations uh, that come forward to the council each year. Uh, the second resolution would be an update to the city's tax abatement uh, guidelines that apply to um, uh, requests from landowners to receive tax abatements. Um, those two items may be ready for council action on at the March 3rd regular session. Uh, there are three ordinances that may be ready for introduction at the March 3rd uh, regular session. Uh, those include two items coming out of the plan commission. I believe one is a PUD the other is a, uh, a rezone. Um, and the third ordinance would be a water bond issuance that is related to the uh, rate increase the council heard about at a January work session. And um, that ordinance was, uh, was delayed at the request of the uh, uh, administration to allow for drafting of, of a related bond ordinance. So those are the five items that may be ready for council action. Uh, some some council action at the March 3rd hearing um, that may be a lot to get through in an hour this Friday. So I'm interested to hear from council members which of those items, uh, all of them or, or a portion of them you'd like to hear about at the work session. Okay, thank you. Um, before we have those uh, that input, um, there is a, um, and I think this is proper to discuss it now, a BEDC yeah. um, event on Friday at noon, um, having to do with this, uh, 
uh, Council Member Scambler probably has more or the, the correct title, and I should have it. But that will be a conflict with our normal noon time frame. Um, is there a way we should specifically handle that um, concern? Go ahead, Council Member Scambler. Thank you. Um, yes, that is a Bloomington Economic Development Corporation annual meeting, and that will include some economic forecasts. I believe that several of us actually look forward to that each year as a touchstone for economic health and may want to attend that. If these pieces of legislation are not going to come to us till March 3rd, would it be possible to shift this Friday's work session uh, to February 26th, just push it back a week. Um, I, I would put that forward as a possibility. Uh, uh, either the parliamentarian or actually Mr. Lucas. Um, I, I will say this as, as president who normally leads that, um, that that is an acceptable change to me. Um, this Friday, um, the reason I did miss one of those the administration standing committee would be the same reason that I could not attend this Friday. So, um, and I'll even get to miss the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation's event that I so fondly look forward to. So uh, I'd like to hear comments from the other council members. Or oh, go ahead, I'm sorry, Mr. Lucas. I was just gonna say, I think if the council wanted to reschedule that meeting, uh, a motion to, to do so tonight would be appropriate. And, uh, uh, I believe the uh, uh, staff members that would be speaking about each of these items um, are aware that this was a possibility. So um, I've, I've not heard any concerns from staff members about being able to uh, uh, attend this week versus next week. So if the council members are, are interested in attending the, the BDC meeting on Friday, I, I don't foresee any issues with the work session. But, but please be aware you'd be hearing about these items the same day that they are likely to be released in the packet, which may... Uh, cut off any ability of staff members to uh, to include any requested information that same day. Um, of course, information can always be provided at a later date um, based on the conversations at the work session. Okay, Council Member Scambolari. Uh, Mr. President, would you like a motion just to? Yes, please. I'd like to move that the work session originally scheduled for this Friday, uh, February 19th, be pushed back one week to Friday, February 26th, also still at noon. Second. Second. Okay, thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, do we have any debate on that? Seeing none, um, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, I'm just trying to capture the language for the motion really quickly. Okay, um, sorry about that. Council Member Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Volan? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Scambolari? Yes. Sims? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you very, very much. Um, again, we've said thanks to a lot of folks tonight and um, and I also like to offer my thanks to my colleagues for being here and um, having such interesting debate this evening. Um, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Stephen or Mr. Parliamentarian, just, do we have anything else? Just one more quick reminder that the uh, 2021 State of the City Address will be next Thursday at 7 p.m. over Zoom. I believe the uh, information for that meeting, uh, which is a public meeting, can be found on the city's website. Uh, that's uh, again next Thursday. So um, interested members of the public should be able to find that that link online if they're wanting to attend. And that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think that's an important reminder. Uh, Councilmember Scambolari. 
And Mr. President, I just wanted to confirm with Mr. Lucas, do you need additional feedback on which items you'd like to, we'd like to see covered at that work session? If there are, uh, I suppose if there are items that council members would not like to <laughs> uh, hear about at that work session, that would be helpful. Um, uh, I can run through them quickly again if needed. I, I would offer the thought, uh, uh, again, I would welcome any of those presentations. I know that um, the highest priorities for me would personally would be the tax abatements and the water bond issue. Um, a lesser priority would be this year's CDBG or, um, allocations because I know those have already been so well vetted. So I would offer that thought if that helps, so. I will say that I'm also ha having, being involved with CDBG, I'm, I'm having the city staff person pull some information together into the form of a report and intend to uh, kind of give that report in a meeting or so whenever he's done with it, so. And I don't know if it's proper, but since we just pushed it back a week, I think there's still time for um, um, individual council members to let Mr. Lucas know um, well before we talk about it next. Well, no, I don't think we will. Talk. Well, you yeah, know, we probably will since it's scheduled for next Friday. But there's still time to contact you as we have time to uh, think about that. Is that correct, Mr. Lucas? Certainly, council members uh, can let uh, me know if... if Yes, if they have specific thoughts. Um, I'll proceed with the assumption that all five um, uh, should be presented. Um, and if council members uh, feel otherwise, you could let me know. Okay. All right, anything else? We'll accept a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Second. All right, thanks everyone again for a very interesting evening. Have a good night and we'll see you all soon.